and a great set of people backing the project. Raksha has all three of them. This university will provide a world-class interdisciplinary education in science and technology. Look at the impact the internet and smartphone have had on our lives. The impact of AI and machine learning in times to come is likely to be transformational. At the end of the day, we are all designing for human beings. We are developing technology for human beings. That is why we are incorporating liberal arts into the curriculum at Raksha. At one end, you're doing AI and ML, and then you're looking at ethics and working environment, human psychology. I think the way we've envisaged Plaksha is uh, it's all about solving for world challenges. Plaksha is defining a new model of engineering education. The curriculum at Plaksha will involve students to learn new age technologies along with the humanities and social sciences. And all this while also imparting leadership ability and developing their emotional quotient to inspire them to take on big challenges. Given that we can start from scratch, we pretty much have lots of degrees of freedom. We are trying to reimagine it in every way possible. Reimagine it in what we teach, how we teach, who we will hire as faculty. How excited we are to partner with Plaksha. Really think about a new model of engineering education, which is grand challenge focused. India is going to be at the forefront of engineering education innovation into the future. And in that space, uh, Plaksha is going to play a really key role. So some of the founders at Plaksha have been involved in building Ashoka University, which within a short span of time has become the torchbearer of a liberal arts education in India. Hopefully, Plaksha will do the same in technology. I believe that India has world-class students. Our vision is to provide the opportunity to build technological solutions for the future. This is why I'm involved in this project, a university for the future.
want kids to develop the art of asking why, to develop that curiosity, and then through that fundamental knowledge, be able to build something real. That is the sense of engineering, and that is the sense of the YTS program. Like We've never done this stuff, we've only done it in class before, like uh, on the board, but we're actually getting to do it. And uh, some things are kind of tough because we're soldering for the first time, but it's still really fun. I never thought I'd be able to see my own pulse by making a machine on my own. We learn, we learn everything about this at school, but we never actually see it. And doing that on our own, it's great. What I really love about this program is that we brought together some very bright kids, some very creative kids with a lot of potential. But what's been exciting is in a, just in a small way, over the course of two weeks, to see them start realizing their potential. YTS curriculum was designed to provide a transformative experience to the kids. I've loved every part of YTS. I kind of understand now that 55 excited kids who are here just for the love and pure love of science can actually change things and make a difference. In general, the engineering education has not evolved enough with times. The attempt with Naksha is to create a truly world-class, forward-looking university. Great universities are about building a great community, a great set of faculty, great academic partners, and a great set of people backing the project. Naksha has all three of them. This university will provide a world-class interdisciplinary education in science and technology. Look at the impact the internet and smartphone have had on our lives. The impact of AI and machine learning in times to come is likely to be transformational. At the end of the day, we are all designing for human beings. We are developing technology for human beings. That is why we are incorporating liberal arts into the curriculum at Praksha. At one end, you're doing AI and ML, and then you're looking at ethics and working environment, human psychology. I think the way we've envisaged Praksha is uh, it's all about solving for world challenges. Praksha is defining a new model of engineering education. The curriculum at Plaksha will involve students to learn new age technologies along with the humanities and social sciences. And all this while also imparting leadership ability and developing their emotional quotient to inspire them to take on big challenges. Given that we can start from scratch, we pretty much have lots of degrees of freedom. We are trying to reimagine it in every way possible. Reimagine it in what we teach, how we teach, who we will hire as faculty. How excited we are to partner with Plaksha. To really think about a new model of engineering education, which is grand challenge focused. India is going to be at the forefront of engineering education innovation into the future. And in that space, uh, Plaksha is going to play a really key role. So some of the founders at Plaksha have been involved in building Ashoka University, which within a short span of time has become the torchbearer of a liberal arts education in India. Hopefully, Plaksha will do the same in technology. I believe that India has world-class students. Our vision is to provide the opportunity to build technological solutions for the future. This is why I'm involved in this project, a university for the future.
want kids to develop the art of asking why, to develop that curiosity, and then through that fundamental knowledge, be able to build something real. That is the sense of engineering, and that is the sense of the YTS program. Like We've never done this stuff, we've only done it in class before, like uh, on the board, but we're actually getting to do it. And uh, some things are kind of tough because, well, it's soldering for the first time, but it's still really fun. I never thought I'd be able to see my own pulse by making a machine on my own. We learn, we learn everything about this at school, but we never actually see it. And doing that on our own, it's great. What I really love about this program is that we brought together some very bright kids, some very creative kids with a lot of potential. But what's been exciting is in a, just in a small way, over the course of two weeks, to see them start realizing their potential. YTS curriculum was designed to provide a transformative experience to the kids. I've loved every part of YTS. I kind of understand now that 55 excited kids who are here just for the love and pure love of science can actually change things and make a difference. Welcome to Infinity, Day 2. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Infinity 2020, Day 2, Track 2. My name is Vineet Gupta. I'm a founder and trustee of the upcoming Plaksha University. I'm also a founder and trustee of Ashoka University. Plaksha University, as some of you know, is an effort to create a high-quality university in science and technology. Plaksha has drawn interest from a wide number of leaders from across the world senior academics, business leaders, global institutions are all coming together to set up Plaksha. Yesterday, we talked a lot about the future of engineering education, what engineering education should look like. We had two exciting panels talking about interdisciplinary engineering education. We had some school leaders really talking about the need for engineers to develop empathy, trust, and all the human values that we crave. We had Professor Mark Somerville in the opening session talking about project-based learning. And he, as he rightly said, it's not important just for engineers to know, know disciplinary knowledge. It's also important Ishpa. for them to do. Ishpa. And eventually then in the closing towards the evening, we had a session on by Professor Sanjay Sarma, who talked about the use of technology in enhancing learning. Today, we take our conversations forward from reimagining engineering education to really talking with some leaders, senior academics, innovators on how technology is being used to solve real world problems. 
we also showcase some outstanding projects by students. To kick off our first panel, I do want to welcome Professor B.L. Ramakrishna. Professor Rama, as we call him very fondly, is the Chief Academic Advisor at Plaksha. In his previous role, he's been the Director of the Grand Challenges Program at the National Academy of Engineering in the US. Rama uh, lives in Arizona in the US, but he's driving all of Plaksha's academic efforts based in US. Uh, he's an alumnus of IIT Madras, IIT Kanpur and Bangalore University. And we are, of course, delighted to have Rama with us at Plaksha. So over to you, Rama, for the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Vineet. It's a great pleasure to be involved in this launching of uh, Plaksha University, the first event that I'm involved in. And we'll be joined soon by three very distinguished panelists. And uh, in discussion with them prior to this, uh, to this presentation, uh, I've asked them to, if I could have the liberty to show a couple of slides and to set the stage so that they can then bring their perspectives and be involved in a, a Q&A or a discussion type of a format. So if I, if I could just start with, with my slides to begin with, then we could uh, take it from there. So what I want to uh, you know, share is what, what, what do we have? What do we mean by engineering? Uh, what do we mean by engineering education? What do we mean by engineering for the future? And so that's what I want to, I want to uh, address here. And then I will let the, the last slide will show something about um, what the ways to solve these problems with, uh, with the various kinds of mindsets. And that's where I think the uh, panelists will come and uh, solve. So I think what we want to do is have start with an inspiring definition of engineering. I think we have been somewhat uh, you know, handicapped by our, our own selves in thinking about engineering in a kind of a limited way. You know, oftentimes engineers are said to be problem solvers. But I think here you see in red, creators of solutions. That's a slightly different way of looking at it. And also it's about not application of science and math to uh, solving problems, but it's about welfare of humanity and the needs of society. So I think that's the way that we want to think about engineering. Engineering was there even well before science, even before we knew how things worked, people designed things in actually humans did that even before the loss of physics and other things were, were discovered. So now after the inspiring definition of engineering, I think we should have a, a vision for engineering for 21st century, which is different from what it was in the 20th century. Uh, unbridled you know, application to uh, development has led to many problems. And so we're now thinking about engineering in a different way in the 21st century. This very short sentence, in fact, captures what engineering should be for the 21st century. Continuation of life on the planet, making our, our world more sustainable, more healthy, more safe and secure, and more joyful. And these are goals that we can have for the entire century. It's not just going to go away in the next five, 10, 15 years. So that's why it's a century long vision for engineering. And this is envisioned by the National Academy of Engineering uh, to, in the US uh, about 10 years ago. And why is it such an exciting time to be an engineer now? And you look at all the technologies, they're all growing exponentially, in fact, there's no longer even steady states of growth. Even the rate of change is also increasing. So you, that's why you hear the exponential. So you see that there's a gap between the way that technology is growing and the way that we are thinking about education or even other uh, institutions uh, of change, like even policies, et cetera. So that, that is more a linear scale, whereas the way that the technologies and engineering is changing is, is an exponential. So this requires, we need to be agile, adapted. In fact, what Professor Yanis Yatsos from USC calls it, you have to hug the exponential. If you're living in a straight line, the gap becomes more and more and more. And then the other thing is engineering is now part of pretty much every field you can think of. Uh, engineering and X, it's, you can think of it as a union for those who are familiar with the set theory. It's a union of uh, engineering and X, where X can be almost anything. You know, med media, medicine, and you see the list in, in my slides there. So engineering is not only applies to these fields, but also, also enriched by those fields. So this two-way co-mingling is what is giving the most exciting time in, in, in history right now. The other thing I would say is, you know, we need a different kind of an engineer. And uh, the World Economic Forum, as well as the National Academies themselves, have come up with two 
kind of uh, mindsets. What, what are the kind of competencies you need for the 21st century? Uh, so creativity, leadership, perseverance is one from the World Economic Forum report and the National Academy of Engineering is, in, is aptly called Engineer of 2020 and we are in 2020 right now. So these are the five mindsets and I'll, I'll probably end with this slide so that I think the, the panelists are the ones who are gonna be really talking about how can you create these mindsets in people, in, in the students and how that will help address the problems, how do we choose the problems and how do we also work with social scientists and humanists, et cetera, to solve those problems. So with this, I ask the panelists to say a few words, maybe three to five minutes, uh, and then say maybe a little bit about themselves if they want to, and then we can have a free flowing discussion. Now, thank you all, and it's been a pleasure to be working with these panelists. Um, are you picking the order or are we just jumping in? Yeah, yeah, J James. Okay, James, Priya, and uh, Iklak, I guess. In that okay, maybe, um, maybe I can just give a brief introduction. So thank you so much, Dr. Iklak Siddhu, Dr. James Holloway, Dr. Priya Jadav for joining us here today. Um, as a brief introduction, Dr. James Holloway is the Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of New Mexico. He's also an academic advisor to the upcoming Plaksha University and has been playing this role for a few years. We are really, really delighted to have you on this board and thank you so much for making the time to join us here today. Um, we have with us Dr. Iklak Sidhu, who is the chief scientist and founding director of the Sutaja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology at UC Berkeley. Uh, Iklak has more than 75 patents to his name he is also um, uh, he, he's also the program director, co-program director of the Tech Leaders Fellowship by Plaksha, which has been running since last year and has played a very, very instrumental role in putting that up uh, along with us and running that through the year. Uh, thank you so much, Iklak, for your entire um, endorsement of Plaksha, your participation in it. And thank you for joining this panel today. Uh, Iklak identifies as an academic entrepreneur, a term that we really learned from him and we're very excited to hear more about that through this panel. Um, we also have Dr. Priya Jadav, who is the Assistant Professor for the Center of Technology Alternatives for Rural Areas at IIT Bombay. Uh, Dr. Priya Jadav is also a co-founder at Plaksha University, and uh, she's brought in a very unique perspective to the entire mission with her entire focus on using technology for solving real problems. Thank you so much, Dr. Holloway, Dr. Sidhu, Dr. Jadav, for being here with us today. Uh, I'm handing it back to Rama to uh, initiate the panel. Thank you. Okay. Kari. Yeah, thank you. That go was ahead. wonderful. Yeah. I, I, I think I'm going to go last. So um, I, uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You know, one of the skills of engineering is to listen first. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take advantage of that. All right, Rama, I'll jump in then if if, uh, if you like. Please, please go ahead. Yes. So, so first, uh, um, thanks for the invitation to join this panel. I've, I've been uh, really uh, pleased to work with uh, uh, Vinit Gupta and his brother and, and uh, many of the other founders, both of Plaksha and of uh, Ashoka before this university. Uh, and, and I should mention I'm a, a nuclear engineer, uh, nuclear engineer by background, uh, and I've done work um, outside of nuclear engineering in uh, uh, countries such as India, in a number of countries in Africa. Um, and, and I very much appreciated Rama's definition of engineering as being about um, solving problems for people. Uh, I think it's always worth it for us as engineers to remember that the work we do isn't for ourselves. We find it interesting and engaging and that's why we become engineers, but the work we do is really for people, most of whom are not engineers. Um, and, and we really have to keep that in mind because one of the, one of the questions that, that um, you have to ask if you're a problem solver, then what is the problem you are solving? Uh, and that is a very hard thing to get at. It's the most important thing you can actually do. Uh, many engineers don't get to do that, uh, but engineering leaders really do. Engineering leaders really have to think about what are the problems that we're solving. And one of the things that makes engineering interesting 
and which leads to both failures and successes is the failure and or success of defining the, of understanding and defining the problem that you're trying to solve. And the reason it's hard is that most humans are not very good at defining their own problems. Um, we, you know, th there's a, a useful construct in psychology called Maslow's hierarchy. And it starts at the very base that the base needs that we all have as humans are food, water, things like this. And then it goes up in, in a hierarchy um, of safety as kind of the next level. And then um, uh, the need for love and, and engagement and the need for self-actualization and, and for esteem. And we're all pretty good at understanding our needs at the lowest levels. We know we need food, we know we need water, we know we need shelter. We're very poor at understanding how to take the abstract needs that are the highest levels that are really deep products of the human mind and turn those into uh, problem statements to solve as engineers. And so really one of the hardest things we get to do as engineers is really understand how are those basic needs turned into problems that can be understood as, as a solvable problem. Um, and it's really, you know, the, there's this question sometimes people ask, do we, do we create need? People sometimes say Apple created the need for the smartphone. No, they didn't. Um, the basic need was the need to communicate, um, the need to be entertained, uh, the need to be connected. All of those can be identified in, in Maslow's hierarchy. The question was, given those basic needs, how do I realize them with the technologies now available? And that was the, the, the genius of the smartphone, to find new ways to um, solve and address those basic needs based on new resources and new capabilities. So really, again, I think the fundamental challenge that the Rama's definition of engineering poses to us is, what is the problem? What is the need, the basic need that it satisfies? And you really should understand the basic need, not just sort of the technical problem of the day, but why do we care about solving that problem? Thank you. Thank you, James. So I guess Priya, would you go next? Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks, Rama. I'm really excited to be here on this panel. Um, so I thought that I will talk about a specific example. I won't take more than four to five minutes. But since there are many students in the audience, I thought I'd take a spe specific example. So I work in this department, um, which is very cross-disciplinary and which has a very high focus on stakeholder requirements. And in our case, it's the rural population. So we put a lot of stress on our engineers to be ready to step out of the bounds of engineering know-how and be willing to engage with stakeholders in an in-depth way to find requ requirements where we can provide value through technology solutions. So I'll talk about an example of public transportation in rural areas because that's very ac accessible to everyone. So now the first thing to look at this uh, our pro problem is the value proposition. What's the need here and what's the value we can provide? So the value proposition here, if you look at school children, we know that school children walk many kilometers to get to, get to schools, many may drop out or the quality of education may suffer because of poor public transportation. That's one of the reasons. People also take uh, private Jeeps uh, to work which, and these Jeeps may be crammed in with like 10 to 15 people in a Jeep or they may be unviable, it may be unviable to keep a job or they may be unproductive in a job because of lack of good transportation. Now the government does have a budget for public transportation. They even have special free buses, uh, you know, sometimes for tribal populations, so the most vulnerable. So there is a value in a solution directly because the government is willing to spend money and indirectly because this is something that leads to societal development, which, is, which even feeds back into a better economy. So while there's money being spent, yet there may be buses which are running empty. And on the other hand, there may be people who are underserved. And there may also be a latent demand. For example, people may not know of jobs because they can't get to certain places or they don't know what exists in you know, the larger towns. And that's where um, development happens, uh, finding the solutions, identifying these needs. So what's the starting point to identify the value? If we just look at the student service aspect and analysis of the number of schools in the districts and the locations, the number of school going children and the distribution across the villages, the routes and schedules of buses in the district. An analysis of these things together will tell us exactly how well this population is served or underserved. And what are the solutions that we can provide? Perhaps an algorithm for scheduling to analyze the profitability of routes, to identify underserved routes, 
and what's the nature of the solutions maybe putting in a digital geography in place so what's a digital geography it's a representation of uh, you know routes bus stops locations to be served the colleges commercial hubs schools that exist so essentially putting this digital geography in place now allows an algorithm to come up with the solutions that we are looking for you know the better uh, where are the underserved routes or uh, etc so what did this solution analysis and um, you know solution a requirement analysis and solution require us to do it requires us to engage with certain stakeholders you know like the regional transport office either the taluka or district level office to get bus data demographic data from the census office lists of schools and colleges from education department so it requires us to get into data sets that exist and also identify and highlight the demand for new ones and putting a system like this into place then provides a platform for gadgets such as apps and gps devices to track buses to know when is my next bus when can i catch it etc so we need to create systems which are the bridge between the latent demand and the value that exists in society this connection between society and technology that is the role of the new engineer and uh, the solutions to these problems can be developed through a very localized engagement in fact they need a localized engagement and what this means is that there's much work to be done every taluka every district has a requirement like this and there are many jobs to fill this is just one example there are many problems to be solved for example the maharashtra government spends some 5000 crores per year per district on new electricity irrigation infrastructure but there's not a single initiative to analyze this uh, design or to improve upon it so just a 1% saving can lead to like a 50 crores per year which is much jobs and much value so um, i think that there is a lot to do out there we just have to find uh, the true requirements thank you hey, thank you priya for really taking a deep dive with one specific example which really truly illustrates this kind of social consciousness that an engineer needs to have to be a truly successful engineer uh, so thank you so much for that i guess ikla is your next and uh, after that we will start a free flowing discussion yeah okay that sounds great so um thanks i didn't know if i was supposed to go last or not but it worked out fine from my point of view because then i don't have to repeat any things that i already agree with that everyone else already said um i can just um say that i agree with first of all yes definition of engineering has been uh too narrow and um you know and, and this problem solving you know that's fine but uh to know which problem to solve means you have to be a little bit earlier in the process and then you know solving a problem is not simply writing the formula of the answer and you know once you have an idea of the solution there's a lot of things that happen after that first version so both knowing what it is and then what are all those steps that happen afterward and frankly some of those steps are social steps they're not only uh technical steps and all these things have to mix together somehow um if i so one i i want to basically say that i'm agreeing i'm agreeing with with everyone here and how i can mix that with um kind of my own journey through this uh in 2005 i came to berkeley and you know my um my big initiative if if you um call it that um was to start what is called the Satarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology so it's been 15 years i you know i've grown it from this very tiny thing to to a much bigger activity you know today literally thousands of students 15 global partners uh 500 executives out of our programs from Apple Google Yahoo network appliances you know i mean like there's it's a lot more than you know uh, um you know like a single class or something like that today and the reason that it was started you know um our pre our dean at the time was very interested that we would have such a thing um and and that was actually um advocated by the uh, entering advisory board of the dean at that time so in that period i'm going to say 2000 to 2005 um there was a lot of interest in what does it mean to broaden education so exactly along the the lines of the things that you're you're talking about and um as we started to get into what it means to to broaden it with these other factors 
the same ones that you're talking about, interdisciplinary mindset, cultural awareness, you know, how do you, how do you broaden those things? Um, what happened was <clears throat> that we originally started off um, with kind of like more straightforward methods, I would say like case studies and, and things like that. To, um, but, it, but in those next five years or maybe a little bit longer, what we really started to see was that it wasn't only about the logic that um, students had. Uh, in fact, their logic and technical skills, uh, usually most universities are good at finding these students who are very strong, both logically and having good technical skills. But there's another dimension and that the other dimension is what is their mindset? What's their behavior? Um, and there's certain ways of seeing the world, that's mindset, and there's certain behaviors. And if you have them, you end up being part of all the new things and you you and you know whether that's starting some company or being involved in some very innovative project or having more success those mindsets and behaviors are fundamental you can't you, you can't just say because you're stronger technically that you can ignore the mindset and behavior part of it and so what we were really working on was how could we teach both you know how could we have these students who were strong in, in both categories, or if we couldn't make everybody strong in both, could we at least put them on teams together so that um, the ones who are strong in different categories at least had a good trust relationship with each other, could appreciate the capabilities that other people um, didn't have, and you, know, and you get to those combinations of very strong, capable teams. Um, most recently, what we've been doing, and I'm kind of finishing off at least for now, because I think you'd rather have, you know, dialogue, um, but, um, but, you know, going from mindset and behavior, uh, the, the next stage was really to bring that deeper into the technical projects, which we do. So instead of, oh, you have one course on getting your mindset straightened out, which is not how you do it, by the way. And, um, and, you know, and another course on, you know, like, you know, some differential equations or, you know, or some circuit theory or something like this, like, no, like, how do you, you know, data science or whatever it is, how do you integrate these things? And so, you know, one of our models that we've been using, um, I'll just broadly um, explain it, uh, we call it innovation collider. And the idea is that people from different backgrounds global students, executives, venture capitalists, undergrads, whatever, if they are all given a certain mindset coming in, and then you put them on teams where they're forced to work together on something, but because they have different backgrounds, different networks, you get outputs that you don't get otherwise. And then we took that idea and we narrowed it so that we could work on very narrow problems specific but with that same model. So we could do um, what's happening in 5G and AI um, by bringing the telephone company executives and our students from different areas to work on things together. Or how do you, you know, we're doing the same thing with our data science type of courses, bringing many companies and so forth and doing that kind of mixing. We do that with blockchain. We do that with alternative meat because um, sustainable, uh, sources of food um, and, and meat don't actually fit together. Like you have to, you know, so it's basically plant-based meat is what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, you know, and we're continuing on kind of in that direction. So I'm going to stop here. I think you've got basically the, you know, the idea of my point of view. Engineering does need to broaden. Um, mindset and behavior is one element, just as important as skills. And how you mix them together is a lot of what we've been working on. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ikla. Uh, I just want to pose one question to the, you know, the panelists. That is, you know, there is so many exciting, you know, tools and technologies that are becoming available. And I think there is also a confluence of understanding the challenges in front of us, you know, for example, you know, climate change uh, for one or other things as well. Uh, but at the same time, you know, having potentially the tools to address them. So I think this kind of confluence of both of them is happening right now. So can you kind of touch upon that, you know, the, the excitement of this moment in time 
where you have a decent understanding of the challenges or the problems, and then you also have potentially the tools to address them, such as the ones that you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, the modern, mo modern tools and technologies such as AI, ML, et cetera, you know, it's sensors, IoT, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, jump in uh, whoever wants to take the first shot at this, but uh, keep, please keep this short so we can have other people's, uh, the other panelists' views as well. Sure, and, and uh, uh, Ram, I'll jump in. And, you know, I think ICLOC actually was, was touching on this. And there's also a question in the Q&A that I think is, is tightly related as well. Um, the, you know, the key thing for, for us as educators is, is how do we educate this next generation of engineers to, to work in this mode? And I think that the answer is, is the kind of work that, that ITLOC is doing at Berkeley. It's the kind of work Ashoka is trying to do. You start engineers in, their, in day one in their curriculum, thinking about complex problems. And, and you know, you, you've, got to spire, you've got to scaffold that and you've got to give them the support to do that because they're, you know, they're not starting with all of the tools that they might need. But you start people very early thinking about complex problems that require multiple perspectives the application of multiple technologies, but also not just technologies that require understanding of policy, uh, civic structures. And, and so you start that day one and, and you teach people not only to think in that broader way, but to work with people who are very different. Because you know, the secret to interdisciplinarity is not for me to learn everything. It's for me to know how to work with many different others uh, and for us to be able to communicate and use each other's strengths. Um, I can go next. So I agree with James that uh, students do need to have exposure to or need to understand, you know, policy and um, just the, these other disciplines and not just the engineering disciplines. And I'll go further and say that they need to look at specific problems to really understand what is the meaning of policy? How does it affect, you know, a solution? For example, the recent uh, unseasonal rains in India, they've created a lot of problems for farmers. So actually starting with, you know, where are the farm, what are the problems that certain farmers have suffered, say the cotton farmers or the soybean farmers, because they haven't been able to harvest or the crop has been destroyed. And how will that connect with the government uh, mechanisms or the government systems? So how does feedback happen? Uh, climate change is a huge problem. There may not be a solution to it, but there may be definitely more, um, you know, uh, direct solutions for how to respond to climate change events. So what are the structures that need to be placed, put in place for a communication of these uh, issues that farmers face and an immediate reaction? So contingency action plan, a contingency climate action plan, which in fact the government has made for various districts, but climate effects are so localized that you need more localized solutions. So uh, what I was trying to say is that the education would be very relevant and very um, effective if we took up case studies and got students working on very specific problems. That's where they start from and then find, uh, you know, the discipline, their, their discipline effects. Of course, we as educators have to find the right problems and the right structure for them so that they can learn their discipline as well as engage with reality. And that's the challenge for us as educators. Yeah, yeah. It's the both, uh, you know, James and Priya. You mentioned this, you know, the the complex problems that we are going to be facing, you know, for the foreseeable future are not just technical, right? It's just socio, technical, economic, cultural, ethical, and you know, you name it. It's it's there. So, how do you then, uh, even if a budding engineer as, as they're getting their education, how do you kind of have them think in this way? Is what I think uh, is challenging because also you have to certainly give a lot of technical depth as well, because what we engineers, we, we, we kind of pride ourselves on the technical and the mathematical skills, etc. We can't kind of undersell that, but at the same time do this. So the, the challenge is, you know, and the opportunity also is to be able to do both. Uh, sorry, Clark, for jumping in there. No, no, that sounds good. So um, uh, let, let me try to keep connecting some dots here. So I, I like, first I like the comment of, interdisciplinary is not about learning every discipline, but it's about being able to work with people who are coming from different perspectives and different backgrounds. Um, and uh, what I'll add to that is, you know how you do that? 
uh, you know, like what, what stops people from doing that to start with? And, you know, I, it really comes down to, can you appreciate them? You know, can you appreciate people who are not just like you? So, you know, when you see, you, you know, like when you see another person and they're coming from, from a different point of view or they have something to say or a different background, um, or, or you even see that they, they're doing something different than you, some people will say, oh, you know what? I, that's not what I do. You know, I'm, I'm good at what I do. And, and they kind of block the fact that that person is, is somehow different or, or whatever. And then there's other people who, will, who are perfectly fine with what they do, but they will recognize that the other person has a capability that, um, that they don't have. And they, and they don't view it as negative. They just recognize it and they just appreciate it a little bit. And the more that you can look at people and say, oh, you know, that is a positive thing. And maybe even sometimes you need to mimic it a little bit or, or like listen a little bit more carefully, even so that you can be like 5% as good at it as, as the other person who spends all their time. That um, behavior uh, basically leads to you working with them. And it also leads to you slowly developing those skills. So like, I just try to make it practical. You know, um, uh, you know when, when it comes to getting people to work together and, and to be interdisciplinary, things like that can make a big difference. Other things are simply like, how often do you just say yes to experiments, you know? Or is everything no? Well, no, we don't do that, we don't do that, you know? Um, and uh, so I don't wanna stop the conversation and you know, talk too long, but um, maybe I'll throw something out so that you guys can respond, which is when we say define problems, I just wanna point out there's, uh, and, and this is following from your earlier comments, there's really different kinds of problems. Um, there's your own problems, right? Like, and guess what? We know our own problems better than we know anything, right? Like, yep, <laughs> you know it, okay? But then there's problems of quote, other people, individuals, businesses, whatever. And so with a little bit of dialogue, listening or whatever, you can get to those. And then there's problems of society in general. And, you know, we're always having to balance these three. It's like you can fix something in the world, but it's not at your, you know, it's at your expense. Or you can work on something for a business, but then it's against the interest of society overall. This, like, understanding that not every problem is simply just the problem in isolation, but these problems balance with each other is, um, is also part of, I think, what we're talking about. Yeah, I think that's a, a key point, and I'll give it a simple example that I think touches on a lot of things people have described here. There's a very famous um, engineering challenge that, that was worked on by a group called Engineering Without Borders, um, which they were trying to provide water for towns in, in um, African country of Mali, and, and so they went and they built a well, problem solved, water provided. They went back a couple of years later, the well was no longer operating. Okay, it's a problem. But then they discovered next to their well, three other wells built by other groups of engineers that had also failed. And theirs was the newest. So they had simply reproduced the same failed solution because the real problem wasn't building a well, it was having the infrastructure to maintain the well. It was a social problem, a civil structures problem. Um, and, and so looking at the problem too narrowly had produced, had wasted a lot of resources. Uh, really, and, and that's pretty easy to do. I think there's a there's another danger too. We get into as engineers, we love the word problem because and we love solutions, right? It's kind of, it's it's sort of related to our upbringing as as you know sort of applied mathematicians in some sense. Um, and and some of my colleagues use the word problematize. We problematize everything. We take everything in the world and we say find the problem, solve the problem. But there are a lot of situations in the world that aren't really problems to be solved. They're situations to be managed or they're social structures that actually work for somebody. It may not work for everybody, but they work for somebody. So we, we need to be a little careful with thinking of everything also as a problem to be solved. Yeah, yeah. yeah that question has come up uh, a few times uh, from the 
uh, in the chat i'm noticing uh, you know that's why i love this uh, statement that said you know engineering is to make uh, world more sustainable more healthy more uh, but and more joyful i mean that the last one which is more joyful is not just about problems like you mentioned it's uh, it's about thinking even beyond the problems uh, there is one question that has also come up I, if you could uh, we have just a few minutes left that is you know is is there a way of the this university let's say plaksha to be involved in even inculcating some of these mindsets in the you know uh, secondary school middle school kind of kids so that they kind of think even then because sometimes they're more natural at it than as they go through more education you know uh, sometimes it happens that way so can students and faculty at plaksha be somewhat involved in this or how can they be involved so uh, is it should it start in middle school high school that's kind of a general and that paraphrasing yeah i'd like to say something about that yeah i i think that that would be an excellent thing for students to get started in school itself and um, the interesting thing in a country well in every country i'm sure has its own problems but uh, in our country the problems are just next door you know just something like trash collection or how traffic lights work uh, just you know put into more simple terms for school students to uh, start thinking about their environment and what the solutions might be would be a very good start um just wanted to respond to a couple of things that james and iklaq said uh, not really respond but just uh, comment that i i think that what uh, iklaq said is very important that people with different mindsets need to come together and talk and in india engineers and social scientists really need to get together and talk and uh, the thing that james said about uh, you know the well um, and work being repeated we really need a way to publish case studies right now the academic publication system is so narrow that uh, we need to broaden it so that this kind of knowledge comes out without having to build on that very narrow academic um, uh, you know fields that already exist I, i i couldn't agree more and i'll i'll mention that one thing engineers without borders does is every year they publish a book of their failures which is a great thing to do um there's a there's a couple of comments in the chat about sort of how you how you make this kind of education work um in in india where so much of the educational system is focused on exams and and attendance and that kind of a very narrow um definition of of uh, of academic success um and and i think that's where really experiments like paksha are important because paksha's goal is to try and move beyond that simple kind of of uh, assessment structure into a more holistic preparation of engineers um and you know uh, hope the the success of experiments like paksha can hopefully over time start to change the system to allow a a richer fully fuller understanding of engineering and engineering education Uh, I, I think I, I, I just note, uh, I'm sorry I think oh, the next panel sorry. is already here so okay uh, being, I'm sorry that but if you have just one one minute to one words of wisdom on Yeah uh, okay fine one minute I can do it um okay. so uh, <laughs> um I let, let's see but hold on what were we even talking about um <laughs> I'm trying to like put it back together um okay well not sure i can do it in one minute now but i guess uh, you know the next panel is here these are students who are gone through this kind of holistic education program in their own uh, education and then kind of uh, come out the other oh. side and have successful uh, careers building so maybe we can hear from them and continue yeah. this actually this is what i wanted to say because i actually wanted to just speak to the students so and i was trying to bridge it which i couldn't figure out so uh, basically the question is what can students do and you know in this environment and i think quite often you know a lot of times students think like what do i need to learn what do i need to learn and i think you got to switch that to um what do you want to do you know so like stop mm-hmm. just like gathering knowledge like you're putting it away in some like big suitcase and you know like there's libraries full of knowledge but you you have to like change that to just pick a thing that you want to do that you can do and just decide you're going to do it that kind of empowerment 
And you'll see part of that doing is naturally social and part of that doing is very like creation oriented. But uh, I think just switch between learning to doing and, and a lot of stuff just fixes itself. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure to have, serve and, uh, have you on this panel and share your thoughts and ideas. And uh, hopefully some of these can be implemented in Plaksha uh, with your help. Thanks again. And over to Pallavi now. Thank you so much, uh, James, Eklak, Priya, for a, for a really insightful session and sharing these stories. And thanks, Eklak, for those closing remarks. Uh, I think that's going to resonate a lot with our audience here. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, you're joining from different parts of the world, um, you know, California, India, and I know this is a very inconvenient time. Thank you so much for, um, for accommodating it. Um, and we look forward to being in touch. Thank you. Rama, thank you so much for hosting bye the bye. session and sharing your perspectives on grand challenges. Uh, and thank you to the audience for your really insightful questions. Okay, so as a reflection from the session and in the run-up to the next, here's a poll for the audience. You're going to see a question on your screen shortly. So the question is that which of these grand challenges are you passionate about solving? It's a multiple choice, so you can pick many. There's sustainability, future mobility, quality education for all, healthcare and well-being. Um, there can be a lot more, but we'd love to hear from amongst these. We'll give you 30 seconds. All right, okay, great. So quality education for all has 50% of 50% uh, of the votes and another 45% say sustainability. Uh, great, so this one is the top choice. I guess it's also a bit of a reflection from the session, but it's also very interesting for us to know that this generation finds this as the top challenge that you want to work on. It works very well for our mission. Thank you so much for sharing these results. And with this background, we're very excited to announce the next session, which is called Lighting a Fire One Student at a Time. This is actually a very special session where recent engineering graduates will be the panelists. Uh, all of you right now spoke about some problems that you're passionate about. This group is similar. Uh, and they actually decided to take that forward and actually put, these pro put this into effect they started working on real problems early on from their time in college. And what we're going to hear right now are their stories of how they started to do that and their journey of personal transformation. Uh, for this session, our host is Mr. Iklak uh, Mr. Akash Chaudhary. Akash is the CEO and whole time director at Akash Educational Services Limited. Uh, for all the students in the audience who've recently taken J or NEAT or plan to do that anytime in the future. Uh, the name Akash is one that uh, you would all be extremely familiar with. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to be fun for you to finally see the face behind the name, uh, very literally. In 2018, Akash was recognized as one of the disruptive leaders by Business World and was listed among the coveted 40 under 40 young leaders list. He is also a founder and trustee at the upcoming Plaksha University. Akash has a BTEC in computer science, MBA from ISP Hyderabad, and is also an alumnus of Harvard Business School. Over to you, Akash. Thank you so much for making the time to host the session. Thank you, Palvi. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, very warm welcome to this wonderful session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, you know welcome Diana, Andrew, Ria, and Lakshay, who will be the speakers today for this panel. Uh, you know, I I can't see them on. Oh, yeah, they're here now. Lovely, lovely. Hello. Good, good to see you guys. Hi. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Diana. 
So uh, first thing first, so, you know, a uh, very, very interesting topic. And, you know, as Pallavi mentioned that, you know, you guys are the fresh graduates out and you've done some wonderful work in your engineering time. And, and I could, you know, I went through your profiles and CVs and, you know, uh, congratulations for, you know, taking this chart of technology and trying to make a difference, make an impact with the help of technology. Wonderful. So why don't we, uh, you know, get started with a round of introduction, you know, uh, I can go you know, as for the uh, pictures that I see on my screen. So Andrew, why don't you start? Why don't we start with you? Sure. So first of all, uh, you know, thank you for, for hosting me and thank you to everybody for organizing this session. I'm really passionate to talk about my experience and really excited, you know, to, to meet everybody. So my name is Andrew Meng. I am a Duke 2012 Grand Challenges Scholar. Um, I studied mechanical engineering and economics. And uh, immediately after graduating, I worked as an analyst at a tech company in New York for about four and a half years. I then started a water engineering and sustainability consulting company in East Africa. And since then have also been doing some independent work in the areas of sustainability and ESG. Lovely, great. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. And uh, maybe we can request Ria next to go on and introduce herself and the work that she's done. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ria. I graduated from USC as Grand Challenges Scholar in 2019, so pretty recently. Um, throughout my undergrad years, I studied biomedical engineering and healthcare studies. I was navigating college pretty pre-med for a while, so I wanted to go to medical school. But then I ultimately transitioned into the world of engineering industry as a result of a lot of the experience that I had throughout the Grand Challenges Scholars program. One of those being um, a digital health startup that me and some friends created my sophomore year, so my second year of college. Um, ultimately, we pursued that path for about two years during college and then didn't end up following through. But right now I work at a company called Edwards Life Sciences, which is in the cardiovascular space. We do medical devices and I'm part of a rotational program there. So I work full time as a medical device engineer now. Great, thank you, Ria. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, I'll go next to Lakshay. Hi, Lakshay. Uh, introduce yourself and the work that you're doing. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, really excited. Uh, please, Peter, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so, hi, everyone. I'm Lakshay Sahani, uh, the co founder and CTO of Stimveda. With Stimveda, we are providing men personalized mental health care to each and every individual using neuroscience and AI. Uh, Stimveda is very personal to me of uh, seeing uh, many mental health issues in my family and around me. And I want to really solve this problem for all the people out there, give them a personalized and affordable way to solve this. Uh, before working, so I, 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 I recently graduated from the Plaksha Tech Leader Fellowship and it has been one great experience where I, I in AI, neuroscience and as well as entrepreneurship. Uh, before this, I am grad from Delhi Technological University, where I mainly was involved uh, in ML research, and I got to intern at various research institutes around the country. Also, got to present my conference research paper uh, in Hawaii, and was funded by the Microsoft Research Grant uh, to present my work there. Uh, in between Laksha and uh, my college, I also worked as an associate consultant in EY. And it has been a very really diverse journey since my college, research, consulting, and now entrepreneurship. So uh, that has been pretty exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshay. Quite a power pack journey, uh, you know, in, in, in an early age. So congratulations for that. Next, I'll go down to Diana. Diana, if, if you could just share your you know, journey with us, your introduction. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Really honored to get to speak with you all today. Um, so I was originally uh, actually on a similar path uh, as Rio with where in high school, I thought I really wanted to be a doctor and ended up uh, applying to university uh, under a biomedical engineering degree and wanted to become uh, and wanted to also pursue that with a pre-med track. Uh, I actually ended up deciding not to go that route because chemistry wasn't necessarily my strong suit and that doesn't necessarily bode well for the medical field. Um, 
Um, but I ended up taking my senior year of high school, um, my first computer science class, and that's when I first got exposed to the powers of technology and really enjoyed that passion uh, of being able to solve problems using um, using computer science and just all the different ways that you can apply it. Um, but I think uh, up until that point, I had known that I really, my main passion was helping people. Um, and I wasn't totally sure how I could fit that in with a computer science degree. Um, so I went uh, on to a university at Arizona State University, um, and I ended up applying to the National Academy of Engineering's Grand Challenge Scholars Program as well. Um, and had a really great time getting to learn and be exposed to all the different grand challenges. But I think one of the biggest things uh, and impacts of the program on me uh, was being able to be exposed to all the different ways that one can apply engineering to be able to solve real world problems. Um, and it really did expand my scope for what engineering can really mean and can be applied to. So during my time in undergrad, I ended up pursuing research for multiple semesters. I ended up pursuing um, trying to create a technical nonprofit uh, within the education space. And I also took a lot of interdisciplinary courses that really expanded my scope and understanding of how the world works and how one can be able to create uh, effective solutions for the variety of problems that are out there, both that are engineering focused and not. Um, as a result, I ended up graduating uh, with my bachelor's in computer science, along with that, uh, uh, that Grand Challenge Scholar Certificate. Um, but I also ended up pursuing uh, a, like a volunteering role, a leadership role uh, within a nonprofit known as Opia. Um, and that's where I've actually been volunteering now for the past two years, um, leading their marketing uh, partnerships and outreach, which is a little different from engineering, but I still get to bring in some of my technical expertise. And I also uh, accepted a full time role within Google as an associate product manager. Where currently I work on their digital well-being team, uh, trying to create tools and resources for people to better manage uh, and balance their uh, their life with their technology. Um, so yeah, uh, really been uh, excited to see all the different ways that uh, technology can really expand our understanding uh, and create effective solutions. Great, lovely. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, you know, now that uh, you know, as you all are aware that. The audience over here is actually uh, you know, a bunch of high school kids, educators, principal, teachers, professors. It'll be very interesting, you know, now that we are in the middle of this pandemic, you know, first of all, to you know, go down to Ria and followed by that to Diana, you know, they were on this chart for, you know, becoming a doctor, you know, getting into medical sciences. So it'll be very interesting for kids who are watching this, who are listening to this, even the professors, you know, who want to understand your psychology your decision making, your route. So how has been your journey and you know, what were the kind of decisions that you guys had to take, you know, which landed you here where you are and you know, how happy you are and you know, if you could change something, what could it be uh, you know, in your journey till date? Ria, can we start with that? For sure. I mean, that's like my entire life journey, but I'll try and condense it a little bit. Um, but no, that's that, that's definitely a really good question. And especially very um, potent right now when I'm sure a lot of students are having to, to think a lot more and reflect a lot more on where their careers are going with um, more unconventional approaches, I guess, um, that they have that they're being forced to take. For me, in terms of how my journey started and how it changed and how satisfied I am with where it ended up. I guess I started pursuing pre-med um, in the beginning of college, but my interest in medicine started a lot earlier than that. Um, I played sports my entire life, and a lot of my interest in medicine actually comes from sports medicine and being able to, like Diana was saying, um, I just wanted to be able to help people. And the most direct path I saw when I was younger was as a doctor who was able to help like young athletes return back to their sport. So that's kind of where that was coming from. And it was one of the first career paths I saw directly right in front of me. Um, so that was where that interest sort of sparked. And, and I decided that was where I wanted to do things in college as soon as I started as biomedical engineering, just because I was really interested in the application of biology and medicine rather than just learning the theory of it. So that's why I wanted to do engineering. I wanted to build things with my hands and understand where it was coming from. I also sort of saw the future of technology and medicine intersecting a lot. And I thought it would be really advantageous to me as a future physician to be really fluent in that language and to really understand um, the technology side of the field, which is, so that's how I decided my major and how, how everything was coming together. But um, what I realized in college was, and this is throughout my entrepreneurship experiences, throughout going to different speakers and, and talking to a lot of different industry professionals, I saw that 
you do, there isn't only one way to help people through the field of medicine. It isn't only as a physician, there's a lot of different avenues you can affect people. And honestly, the Grand Challenge Scholars Program was one way that helped me approach that problem in a lot of different ways, because I picked my challenge, which was engineering better medicines. But the way that USC structures the program, you have to essentially pursue that path in five different ways, which is like through entrepreneurship, through international experience, through research, through all these things. So I was forced uh, almost to approach how medicine would look in a lot of different avenues. So I realized as an engineer, I had the unique opportunity to not only impact patients, but to impact thousands, if not millions all at once with the power of technology. So my sophomore year with the digital health startup, we were approaching the problem of stroke care and accelerating stroke treatment for patients. And this is a huge problem. Like so many people in the United States around the world um, experience stroke either directly or have relatives that do. It's a very, very common problem. And it's one that's very treatable if you get patients to the hospital quickly enough. Um, and we were able to design this app and we came up with a lot of research and talked to a lot of different people, pitched this, this idea to a lot of different groups. And we understood how much power a, a, an app or a company or something that was addressing this problem could how much impact it could have because you could affect all of these people that are affected by this problem on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was where I started to sort of shift my mindset directly from pursuing the path of medicine as a doctor to pursuing the path of a biomedical engineer and an engineer working in the space of medicine. Um, that career path has taken me to a company like Edwards um, because Edwards Life Sciences is a company that is focused in the cardiovascular space. But again, we approach the problems in heart health from a lot of different angles, whether that's direct heart valve replacement therapies, whether it's monitoring systems, whether it's early stage diagnostics platforms, we kind of run the gamut of, of cardiovascular treatment. And the reason that going to that company made a lot of sense to me right after graduation was I never lost my spark for entre entrepreneurship. That's still where I sort of see my future going but I really wanted to be able to understand industry from like right after college, it was a great experience to learn and to really just learn as much as I could about what industry looked like and, and how I could be an engineer and how I could be a successful engineer and how I could be an impactful engineer in the medical space. Um, so that's where I ended up now. And I have no regrets about it. I feel like I've learned something new every single day. And I was a little bit scared of what corporate America was gonna look like and how, if I was actually going to feel the kind of impact that I romanticized in my head about an engineer and, and I feel that every day. So I am really, really happy with where my career path has taken me. Definitely not where I saw myself five years ago, but I'm really excited about what the next five years might hold. So. Very, very interesting. And you know, the, the very important point you made Rhea that, uh, you know, uh, when you are choosing a career, especially in medicine, uh, you know there is a balance between you know short-term impact and a long-term impact, and the scale of impact that mm -hmm. you want to build. Uh, maybe you know a doctor can, you know, make a huge impact, but you know obviously the scale is limited to the patients. And absolutely, you know, biomedical engineering, you know, is, is a fantastic space. And you know, uh, for Diana also, you know, uh, you know, with the Grand Challenge uh, Scholar, and you know, you mentioned about you know balancing the life uh, and technology together. So how has been your experience, Aina? You know, I'm sure, you know, some of the choices would have been similar, but, you know, what are those experiences that, you know, got you here? Yeah, um, I think a lot of, um, like, kind of, like, one big thing that I think I saw throughout my my life that has kind of, like, helped me grow and, like, was, was kind of an obstacle that I had to overcome a little bit was um, being able to really expand my mindset of what I thought I could be. And especially, like, when I decided I wanted to be an engineer, like, what being an engineer could could mean and could look like. Um, like I touched on a little bit, like the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, I think helped a lot. Um, but when it came down to like very explicit decisions, I think like one of those things was uh, when I was first deciding whether to do computer science. Um, like I said before, I'd always wanted to be a doc. I wanted to be a doctor because I thought that was like the one main way that you could be able to help people. That was like the one career where I could just go in and be a, a directly making impact on people's lives. Um, and I just didn't really have the mindset to really explore outside of that because I thought that that was really the best way to help people in the way that I thought I wanted. Um, but I think eventually I, I started thinking more critically about it. And after taking my first computer science class, I realized that 
I think my natural strengths lied more in computer science and that I found I really, really enjoyed it. And so I figured if I really enjoyed it and I had the strength, then I would find a way to be able to help people in that field. I just wasn't really sure what that looked like quite yet until I went to university. Um, where then I, when I was in the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, um, like Rhea mentioned, it really does um, really push you and challenge you to explore the like given Grand Challenge in a lot of different facets. So like one of the ways that we have to do that is research. And I just never saw myself as a researcher. I like didn't really think I was a very academic person. I, I enjoy reading and learning, but I was like, I don't know if I really wanna go into that, um, like very, a very niche area and just explore that for my entire life. But I actually found by forcing myself and challenging myself to go outside of those bounds, I was able to learn that I really am like, it really just does touch in on like my natural curiosity and love of learning. But I could also tap into like my passion for making um, a better uh, education for everyone, you know, things like that. Um, and it was the same way for the entrepreneurship side where I never saw myself as an entrepreneur, but forcing myself to go outside of my bounds. I was able to go to pitch competitions. I was able to um, create like a plan for what I wanted my nonprofit to look like. Um, and even though I didn't end up pursuing that post-grad, I, I still feel like that experience helped open my eyes to just the wide variety of applications that technology can have. And it helped me to also see, uh, also get the confidence to be able to explore outside of the traditional boundaries of what like computer science looks like. Um, and, and so in the end, when I ended up trying to uh, decide which uh, role I ended up wanting to go into after I graduated, um, I didn't go into a traditional software development role, um, which seemed a little scary to me because that's what I had envisioned once I'd actually chosen to go into the computer science field. But I ended up deciding to go into product management because I realized that Truly, while my interests were in software development and I really enjoyed that realm, um, I wanted to be able to tap into more of that interdisciplinary aspect that I really enjoyed in my learning and in everything else I'd done. Um, so I think like uh, I would also kind of maybe encourage people who are listening to and trying to decide like, oh, should I do software development or not? Um, I think like also consider there are a lot of different other realms you can go into even if you are majoring in computer science. It doesn't always have to be that you're a software developer. If you're really interested in design or you're really interested in business or you want to bring all those things together, I think you can always feel free to kind of explore and ask questions about like what other things could I be doing? Because I know that like if I hadn't done that, then I wouldn't have been in the role where I am today. Um, so I, I'd say again, like I also have no regrets except for maybe if I could have had the opportunity, maybe if I'd taken my first computer science class earlier, then maybe I would have had more of an opportunity to explore that before I went to university. Um, but I think it was just that mindset where I didn't think of myself as a computer scientist until I got there. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I'm really happy with where I am. Great, thank you, Diana, for sharing that. In fact, you know, you guys start with, you know, uh, you know, listening to you and Rhea, you guys started off with certain mindset and, you know, when you started exploring the opportunities and the possibilities of, you know, the stereotypical streams of education and the impacts that you wanted to create, which was fairly larger than what, you know, uh, has been happening in the past. I, I think you've rediscovered uh, the application and the use of, uh, you know, your education and new fields that was far more impactful. And, you know, going into that specific comment here you know i see that andrew's been into mechanical engineering and you know economics done really really well in undergrad and then moved on to you know agriculture and you know worked as an analyst and now into a startup and that into new market so you know how's been your journey Andrew? you know uh, you know just putting it all together and you know you are in the heart of the uh, you know startup ecosystem so how's that ecosystem that environment changing the way you are and what would you suggest to kids who are, build, who are trying to build a career in startup? Oh boy, well that's that's a big question. I could I could talk about that for a long time, um, but I think that you know um, I'm still on the journey. I think is the first thing I want to say. I think um, you know I've been out of university now for about eight years, and um, and every year I'm doing something new in some way. Um, every Every new client relationship I build, every person I meet, you know, I try to learn something from. Um, and I think when you think about the startup ecosystem, especially, um, it's 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 a very generalist and broad area. But having technical skills is very very important because 
that's usually the root of what you're doing. Um, if you want to go into the startup world, I would say that the biggest challenge is really the lack of structure and the ambiguity and you know there's no there's no roadmap it's not like a university where you know oh i need to take this course and this course and this course to graduate you know it's you just you do some things you make some decisions some of them are right some of them are wrong and you just hope that the the good things that happen outweigh the bad things that happen um but what i would say is i do think that in the startup world um you know, I think that sometimes it's really intimidating to see some people, you know, you hear these stories of, you know, young people who, you know, whether through luck or skill or whatever, you know, they, they, it's like they're these like geniuses who had these great ideas and all of a sudden now they're, they have their own fleet of, you know, fancy cars and everything. Um, and I think, you know, the thing about entrepreneurship is that you just have to do it. Right. And, and I've definitely had times where I looked at myself and I said, oh my gosh, like, you know, I, I don't, you know, sometimes you, you read interviews with these people and they just seem so brilliant. And you think to myself, well, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not always confident in everything I'm doing. And, and, you know, but then I think what I've learned over the years is that everybody has doubts. Everybody's nervous. Um, some people are better at hiding it than others. And, and that's really the only real difference between all of us. Um, and so what I would say is honestly, just go for it. You know, it, it, especially with entrepreneurship and startups, you really need to be in it to learn it. Um, it's very different to start your own company than it is to just read about other people starting their own companies. Um, I think in terms of how it's impacted me, um, you know, one of one of I guess the more interesting things about my career is that most of my career has actually not been working with engineers because or, I mean I work with engineers, but I don't work for engineers. You know, I'm someone who people who are not engineers hire me to do things. And so something that I think has been really interesting is that, you know, if if you were to put me in a room, I mean, look, I'm not gonna lie, you know, I'm in, I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer, I got great grades and everything, but there are people who have technical skills that are so much better than mine. Um, but what I'm good at is I can take those people's technical reports and I can turn around and talk to the CEO. Um, and, and being able to communicate effectively with people who don't have an engineering background or technical background is, um, is is also a very important thing to be able to do. And I think that my experiences in the startup ecosystem have really uh, shaped me in that way as well. Great. So, I mean, this is, this is very interesting. You mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, having tech skills is very, very important and, you know, at, which is at the root of it. And, you know, as you know, you can't change the fruit if you don't change the root. So, you know, technically you have to start with that and, you know, technical skills today, I, I wouldn't say they are an option. I think this is that that's, that's something which is mandatory and it is so interdisciplinary that, uh, you know, medical sciences and technology, agricultural sciences and technology, artificial intelligence playing roles in, in, in the ways and in the sectors which we have never ever imagined. So, you know, I, I, I want to go down to, uh, you know, Lakshay, Lakshay, how's been your journey at TLF and, you know, uh, what, what did it really help you? You know, if, you know, we've been talking about entrepreneurship here and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a big word. It's a buzzword. And uh, it, it always doesn't mean money or fame. It means, you know, getting behind uh, something that you really want to do, something that you want to make an impact with. Uh, so what does it mean for you, you know, gone through a wonderful education, uh, you know, in undergrad and now at DLF and now, you know, starting your journey. So what does it mean for you and for the kids who want to hear you? Right. Uh, so first of all, uh, as Diane also said, uh, she did not think that she was a researcher uh, during her college life. It was totally different for me. I always thought that I'm a researcher. I wanted to pursue research. I wanted, I, I did research in my four years of college, uh, published my papers. And entrepreneurship never, you know, wasn't the one thing which I wanted to do during my entire undergrad. Even uh, before I, even during a joint laksha, that was not the top thing on my mind, which was very different from most of the other people. Other people joined laksha TLF to pursue entrepreneurship. So I think that happened uh, uh, with me by chance that I somehow found the perfect person to work with, my, my co-founder Ramya, and uh, we discussed how uh, we have faced mental health issues with our own family. And I think that that's uh, combined with the interest in neuroscience plus artificial intelligence. 
really uh, you know led us to work on such a problem so uh, it wasn't something which i had planned but right now it's been 6 months since i have been into this space uh, it 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 has been really exciting for me to work in this uh, we are developing a prototype talking to multiple people uh, our work is not just the technical part as andrew also mentioned but also talking to different stakeholders uh, we regularly talk to all the doctors around the country and i think that has been uh, really interesting that how uh, one your choices change so much so soon for example from research to now entrepreneurship which are generally uh, very different from each other that uh, but yeah so uh, one thing which i would specifically would want to highlight for uh, every uh, most of the students here is that to uh, explore uh, to not uh, confine themselves into particular rat races which i actually did for a very long time even if you want to play safe bets maybe uh, hold them on for the when you are old when you are young try to explore different things try to be active uh, and explore and grab opportunities that come your way and once they do come your way pick them up and work hard on that specific thing and i learned this very late uh, but i hope that others be other people don't do the same mistake so yeah uh, yeah thank you thank you lakshay and you know uh, you you're talking about entrepreneurship here and you know how uh, you know you you pick up uh, the opportunities on the way and you 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 try to get on with it try to explore that uh, just not get uh, you know boxed into your earlier education or earlier thought process you know this is a very wonderful uh, you know experience that you're sharing and as we all have experienced that the world is absolutely interconnected you know the corona has the covid-19 has shown us that you know you stop one sector or one part of the world how you know things are so very well connected so in your you know i just it's an open question anybody can answer you know probably a last question we just run out of time uh, uh, you know in this inter you know connected world so how how you know what are the limits of technology that we see uh, you know we see today uh, uh, are going to become you know a challenge and you know how how the how at what point will these uh, technology innovation going to start interfering negatively to education and how can we stop it and you know in your minds you know how do you have you know define boundaries around you you know uh, while you are in education while you're building your career and not let not let this technology uh, confuse you or distract you from what you really want to do anybody can take it Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say um I mean this this could just be because I'm a little bit older than than <laughs> some of the people I'm working with. I'm not that old. Um but but I I've, I've noticed that you know there's there's like a wave of technologies that I just missed, right? And so sometimes when I'm working on some projects there are some technologies where you know I just haven't had the experience with them and um and i think at the end of the day you know especially with the times we're in right now i mean we do what we can and sometimes it means i have to learn new things but at the end of the day i'm trying to do something specific i have a reason you have to stay focused i think it's like anything else i think that the real challenge with you know the current environment is just there's so much uncertainty and you know as as someone who's running a company sometimes i ask myself should i be trying to implement technology to allow me to do something whatever it is the same way we did before at the same level of productivity or is this something where i need to accept okay things just aren't the same right now and i think that that different people answer those questions very differently which i think leads like you know leads to friction and confusion and stress um but yeah it's it's hard i don't know if that's the i don't know if that answer is really answering your question but that's my thought No, I mean it's interesting you say that you know the fundamentals of business career technology universe entrepreneurship they do not change you know you got to remain stay focused uh, in whatever you want to do and you as they say you know as the captain of the ship stays you know uh, stay fast stay true you know if the if there is a storm just hold on to your you know wheel and just stay to the course and you will you know reach your destination and just don't get bothered about what's happening just experience it just explore it and don't get uh, you know uh, scared with that so with this uh, note you know i i like to uh, 
call off this session and hand it over back to Pallavi. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you so much for uh, you know bringing in this wonderful insight. I'm sure uh, you know students, teachers, and professors who are watching this uh, would, would have found it really, really insightful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for hosting. For having us. Thank you so much, Andrew, Diana, Ria, Lakshay, for those fascinating stories and uh, you know the inside dope on what it takes to do entrepreneurship, what it takes to actually solve problems on the ground. Uh, I'm sure the entire audience found this just as inspiring as we did. Thank you so much for making the time. And thanks, Akash, for being just an absolutely terrific host uh, and helping derive such meaningful, meaningful insights from this session for everybody. Thank you, everybody, for Thank your you. time. Thank you, everyone. All the best. Thank you. OK, so in the run up to the next session, there is another poll for the audience. You will see the question on your screen shortly. So how old do you think Michael Dell was when he started the company? We'll give you 30 seconds. All right, okay, we have the results. 44% uh, people said 21, 35% said 19, 20% said 31. Nobody thought it was 40 years. Okay, so the right answer is actually 19. Uh, so a lot of you did get it right. And on that note, we'd move on to our next session, which is called Tinkerer's Chronicles. Here we are going from young engineering graduates to even younger high school students. And that was the context in which uh, you, know, you answered this question. These students will now showcase innovative projects that they've built from hoverboard inspired wheelchairs to devices for reducing honk honking and more. The host for this session is my colleague Sanat Sogani, who is part of the Blaksha team and plays a key role in school outreach and admissions. Over to you Sanat to commence this session. Thank you so much Pallavi. Um, you know, when I was in school, uh, I remember I was a big fan of Steve Jobs. I wanted to be an innovator like him. Uh, I teamed up with several of my friends and on several days we were like, okay, today we are going to develop something great. We're going to solve a problem. Uh, but almost always we dropped halfway because there was something more important to do. It was an exam, an internal assessment or something at home happening, etc. So. I think in my school outreach experience, some of my most powerful moments are when I meet students who at the age of 15, 16, 17, have not only shown uh, deep feelings for a particular problem, but have actually managed to solve it, to approach people using that product, and even think about developing it into something that can be adopted at a wider scale. Today, we have with us uh, four such organizations who have demonstrated exceptional commitment to nurturing uh, innovators. Uh, before I name them, it's also worth acknowledging the efforts uh, by some wider organizations such as uh, the Atal Innovation Mission, which I think has really accelerated the pace of innovation at school level in India. Uh, the four organizations are from very different parts of the country. I'm going to name them in the order in which they will be presenting. We have with us Shivnadar School Gurgaon, uh, Pajam Foundation, which works with schools from multiple uh, states, including Telangana, Kashmir, uh, Central Delhi, et cetera. Uh, we have Shri, Shri Academy from Kolkata, uh, and finally, Lalaji Memorial Omega International School from Chennai. Uh, so first, I'd like to call upon Arshia and Tanya from Shivnadar School Gurgaon, uh, who developed an excellent project, developed in low cost wheelchair, which has also gained a lot of publicity in newspapers. And we also have with us Ms. Deepa, who has uh, sort of mentored this project from end to end. Over to you, Tanya and Arsha. Good 
Good morning to everyone present here. It is an honor for us, Tanya Singh Yogi and Arsha Mago, to be a part of Laksha University's Infinity 2020. And we are here to talk about our group project, Havachev. The number of people in India with a locomotive disability are more than 5.4 million. And the number of people using a manual wheelchair are around 1.2 million. This data is taken from the 2011 census. Uh, moving a manual wheelchair requires the user to apply a lot of pressure, causing pain in their neck and shoulders. In addition, they may get blisters on their hands. After identifying the disadvantages of a manual wheelchair, uh, we devised the idea of a wheelchair that would overcome these demerits. The mission of Project Hover Chair is to provide a customized, congenial, and cost-effective wheelchair that helps physically disabled and senior citizens lead independent lives. Now talking about the working of a hoverboard. Hoverboards are also known as self-balancing boats that add frames that pivot in the center. They have electric motors and sensors that detect speed and tilt angle, and they are placed inside each wheel. We often consider a hoverboard a toy. All of our group members had the same question in mind, and uh, which was, can we use a hoverboard for a completely different purpose? Now, pondering over the same question, the solution we proposed was to design a customized wheelchair, which is attached to a hoverboard and functions with two levers on each side. By moving the levers forward, the pressure would be applied in such a way that the chair would move forward. And similarly, pulling the levers backwards would make it move that way. This way, the user does not need any external help. The customized seat has two wheels in the front and the hoverboard at the back, we added footrests and a pouch behind for the user. So we started off by modifying a normal wheelchair by attaching hoverboards and levers. Uh, after the prototype testing, we realized that chair, the, uh, the wheelchair will function better with the customized seat. And as you can see, we did exactly that. The cost of hoverchair is around 22,000, which is way cheaper uh, as compared to a 90, uh, as compared to an average of 90,000 or more for a normal electric wheelchair. The weight of an electric wheelchair is about 50 to 100 kgs, whereas the weight of our wheelchair is 15 to 20 kgs. Now talking about the battery life, the charging time for, our, uh, for a normal wheelchair is around eight to 12 hours. Uh, and it can run up to eight hours, but uh, uh, the charging time for our wheelchair is three to four hours and it can run up to four to five hours. This may vary on the hoverboard used. Uh, here we have a glimpse of our journey from last year. Speed, 
very nice, very practical. With few modifications, you can do wonders. We must appreciate, we must try to encourage the children who have done this wonderful job. At this point of time, if they are doing this thing, what, what to expect from them in the later stages? They might do wonders. Powered by battery and uh, motors, and you can, you know, go around with it very simply. So, as compared to a manual wheelchair, yes. uh, is there any pain for you? A thousand times better. It is a thousand times better. Also, wheelchair, uh, you know, it's, uh, I can't believe it's been in 25,000 rupees. Uh, that's one of the most affordable uh, automatic wheelchairs that I have seen. And it's good looking, it's foldable, it's not extremely heavy. And I think we uh, give more time to it, we can convert it into a commercial product. So, all the best to the team. And I think the team and others will also be able to make the project. Innovation is different to the day of the So, thank you. So after creating our prototype, we visited various old age homes and NGOs to test our hover chair and receive feedback. We contacted Mr. Nipun Malhotra, who is the founder of Wheels for Life, and we plan on partnering with the foundation. Uh, we got positive feedback from the Earth Saviors Foundation, where they loved our prototype and were impressed with our innovation. Uh, we often divide inventions into past and present, ancient and modern. And in our project, we merged two ideas, a manual wheelchairs from the 16th century and hoverboards made in the 21st century and created something that will open up pathways for independence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tanya and Arshia. Uh, I think the clarity with which you presented your project just tells us the kind of thinking and effort that would have gone in from understanding the kind of issues wheelchair users face to what are the most viable solutions. Uh, next up in line, we have uh, Shankar from the PyJam Foundation. everyone my name is Shankar and that was my story from recent time. A few days ago my brother had developed a skin disease and was transmitted to all of us. This got me thinking that this must be happening with a lot of people in everyday life. So why do not I create a model using technology that allows self detection of skin disease reduce the risk of spreading the disease and also helping patient to take next steps accordingly. Now I will explain you how the model that I have created can be used to identify a skin disease. 
A user or a person can click the picture of the skin disease on the any part of the body and then upload the picture to the model. The trained model will analyze the uploaded picture by using technology of artificial intelligence and predict the result. REST API can be used to deploy the model in any our website apps or phone app. Now let me show you my data set. I had identified different skin disease in humans using the data set provided by open sourced IEE port. I labeled each set and every label had contained approximately 25 pictures. The model is then trained and after training it resulted in a average precision of 0.79. A confusion matrix showed that our model had often classified each label correctly. The last step is to test our model. We can upload one or more than one image simultaneously. For testing we will upload the image that's not been trained or are not there in our data set. As we can see tested image showed us the nearly accurate result. Now this can allow anyone to identify skin disease by themselves and can reduce the risk of spreading it and also taking the required right steps. We have taken a limited number of images and labels in our data set. However, we can improve our accuracy by making our score of the model wider. Thanks everyone for listening. I am exploring more of artificial intelligence and machine learning and how I can leverage it to create solutions for our everyday problems. Thank you again. Shankar, we are not able to hear you. Uh, no, you're still not audible. Maybe Pranjali, do you want to jump in while he figures out? Yeah, sure. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, Plaksha University, for giving this first because we want to prepare our kids for a rapidly changing future. To computer science, we are trying to build problems and digital skills for the students of today so that they are problem solvers and digital natives for the future. What we do at PyJam is teach problem solving through technology. When I say technology, it's a mix of electronics, programming, physical computing, that is. We use Raspberry Pis that are really cheap and very popular computers which makes it perfect for the Indian context and the schools we work with. Our PyLabs are a comprehensive ecosystem for learning and experimentation. We try to make, connect, translate logic sequential thinking from day one in our PyLabs and to be able to relate it to what kids are doing in everyday life and hoping that they would actually use these skills to solve problems in their community when they grow up. We believe um, it's not just coding or creating projects, but being responsible human and citizens who use tech for good. Over to you, Sanat. OK, thanks, Tranjali. Shankar, are you back? Yes, sir. OK, awesome. Please go ahead. Hey, everyone. Me, Shankar, and I'm currently studying in grade 12. And I am a student leader at PyJam Foundation. So till grade eight, we never had a computer classroom in our school. The first time when I was introduced to computers was when Shoye Bhaiya, the founder of PyJam Foundation, introduced me to Raspberry Pi, which is a small computer. And I was really excited to see how we could create different things using Raspberry Pi and could control different things using a Raspberry Pi. Since then, I haven't looked back and uh, studied a lot of things like Python and some components of AI. I love talking to computers by giving them instructions. And debugging is my favorite part because that's the time when I see my project actually working. And even if it doesn't work, I love to figure out where the actual problem is. And uh, why I love computer science is because it makes me think logically and the process of identifying a problem and then 
planning and then when i finally use technology to solve my problem something i enjoy the most i have been working on a lot of projects like weather station plastic and right now i'm working on automatic sanitizer i chose to work on this project because i saw the problems happening in my community i wanted to solve them after that i wanted to do something and if my and community of my and thank you uh, okay thank you shankar i think uh, we're losing you uh, but i think what stood out for me uh, in your presentation is that you barely got a chance to use a computer in the early days of your childhood and now you have come all the way to develop something using ai and machine learning often considered the most advanced forms of computer science today to solve a problem that is extremely important and i'm sure pyjan foundation has had a huge role to play in it uh, as pranjali mentioned it's an organization that operates across india and has already helped close to 15000 students um up next we have uh, mitadru das gupta from uh, shri shri academy and before he starts talking about his project we have mr abhishek who is the atl in charge at shri shri academy kolkata to give us an overview of their school uh, as well as their innovative philosophy a very good morning and namaskar and namaskar to all the distinguished guests present this morning uh, on behalf of shri shri academy uh, well we are extremely thankful to plaksha university for giving us this wonderful platform and here we are to present our innovative project in front of you now in uh, the journey of our atl lab that we have in our school it started in the year 2018 in the month of march and since then the students from class 6 to class 10 they have been tinkering and transforming their creative ideas into reality we work as a team in our lab we Uh, plan we execute we fabricate we assemble the components and finally we test our model and then we present our model however we at shishi academy do believe in community service also and that's why every year without fail we organize the atal community day which is on the birth anniversary of dr b r ambedkar on 14th of april and on this particular day we invite all the underprivileged schools that are there in our locality and we arrange a workshop for all of them on this particular day the students of shri shri academy who have already been trained in this particular lab they give a hands on experience to the invited students and this actually helps in creating and promoting uh, you know a kind of stem education for all in our society and now I have Mitadru Das Gupta of Class Eight Standard of Shri Shri Academy, who will enlighten you more on the innovative project that we have developed in our school's ATL lab. Over to you, Mitadru Das Gupta. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, Mitadru. Okay, great. Uh, So I am Mitadri Das Gupta, and today I will be representing my school, Shish Academy. So our school is an ATL lab where we develop an innovative project. And today I am going to show you one such innovative project which has brought accolades to our school. It's the blind stick. uh basically a blind stick is all we know is a wooden stick but we here at shish academy have assembled components motherboards microcontrollers sensors to make it a smart blind stick and we have been successful to cure the problem that usually a visually impaired person suffers the components uh, incorporated in this projects are arduino genuino uno r3 as the motherboard ultrasonic sensors three ultrasonic sensors of model hc sr04 one 5 volt button size vibrating motor along with a 5 volt buzzer so after uh, we identified what are the components that would be perfect for the circuit we assembled it 
And now we have the complete frame circuit. After that, we install that fully assembled circuit into the wooden stick to transform it into a smart blind stick. Actually, the three ultrasonic sensors were put at three different heights, which basically helped us to identify obstacles at three different levels. One was below the knee level. The second one was at the knee level. And the last one was at the waist level. So as these three different heighted ultrasonic sensors were at three different levels, they helped us to detect obstacles also at three different heights, such as a simple stone or a rock to tables, chairs, beds, or even staircases. The entire process would run with a nine volt battery, which was fitted into a 3D printed battery case, as you can see here. The software used for the coding was Arduino IDE, and the sensitivity range of the ultrasonic sensor was found out to be 20 centimeters. We worked in a planning, execution, and demonstration team. Before we watch the video, I want to introduce you to one special feature of the blind stick. And that is that we had added a 5-volt button size vibrating motor. That was because if someone was aged or had a hearing disability, he or she, suppose, doesn't hear the sound of the buzzer. Still, he will be warned by the vibration caused by the vibrating motor whenever it senses an obstacle. Now, we'll take a look at the demonstration video of the smart blind stick. We are from Shisha Guy. This is our project. We have named it Blinds. We have two free ultrasonic sensors one Arduino Hemino Uno and one a buzzer and a vibrating motor in this project. This, this process will generally enable the blind person to understand if there is an obstacle in front of the motor. Whenever, the, whenever there is an obstacle in front of the blind stick, the circuit will be completed and the buzzer will start buzzing. Uh, if the, at the same time, if the blind man is deaf at the same time, then uh, the vibrating uh, motor will start vibrating and it, uh, it will indicate him that it is working and uh, there is an obstacle in front. Thanks for being such a patient audience. And now we are open to your questions. Thank you, Mitadru. Um, I remember when we were first discussing doing this showcase uh, and we were deliberating on which schools to reach out to, Sri Sri Academy Kolkata was one of the first ones on our list, simply because of the absolutely wonderful work that your ATL lab has been doing. Uh, thank you so much, Abhishek, sir, for joining us uh, and Mitadru for your presentation. Uh, thank you. Finally, now we have a team from Lalaji uh, Memorial Omega International School. Uh, we have Yohita and Jostev uh, who are going to talk about a project they developed to reduce railway calamities. Over to you, Jostev. So, greetings to one and all. This is Jostev and Yohita here from Lalaji Memorial Omega International School, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. So our project name is Railway Calamity Prevention Kit. How does the train meet with an accident? The project is mainly made for the train drivers who take micro sleep during a long drive due to tiredness and drowsiness. Some drivers work hard continuously due to lack of efficient drivers. Sometimes they are compelled to work without rest. The train drivers unethically take drugs during working hours before they drive the train, so they close their eyes. Here we can see a view on the number of accidents due to lack of attention like drowsiness, driving related inattention and so on. Do you know what problem the system arrests? 
Many train drivers close their eyes due to overload of work. If drivers close their eyes, the train may meet with an accident, causing danger to all the passengers. Each year, nearly thousand people are killed in train-related accidents. I am Lohita Balaji. Balaji Memorial Omega International School, Chennai, has a special space for innovation called as Atal Tinkering Lab. The Government of India initiative to solve any community problem follow steps of design thinking. In addition to that, we learn physical computing, computational thinking, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, Internet of Things. In Atal Tinkering Lab, we have a special place called as Idea Factory. For that, we collect ideas from all over the school in idea boxes. Of empathizing, we came across an alarming fact that micro sleep episodes among fatigue drivers heighten rate of rail accidents. How the train accidents happen? There were too many factors out of which one factor is a potentially applicable project idea. So he took that idea. The idea is about um, like train drivers due to uh, overtiming of work, they tend to close their eyes. The prototype consists of a Raspberry Pi board, a web camera, a sensor, LED, buzzer and of course a set of suitable. So I made a project uh, uh, for the drivers who close their eyes due to their drivers. So, uh, my project name is uh, Railway Accident, Train Accident Prevention using Raspberry Pi APIs. So, we will get into the project. So, uh, when I close my eyes, the buzzer will automatically start. So, I will just test it. So, I am going to close my eyes. Yeah, it started to blink when I close my eyes. So that's all about my project. This is This device can not only be installed in trains, but it can also be used in cars, buses, trucks, and any other automobile. The sensitivity of this device can be customized according to the needs. This doesn't require any wiring, and it occupies less space. It can also be powered using solar panels. Every blink of an eye changes lives. Can you guess the functioning of the program? So this project is made with Python on Raspberry Pi. The webcam directs size in the given ratio in the program. It checks the color of our sclera, the tough layer of our eye and the face. If the colors are same, the buzzer starts to ring. The color differs, it stops ringing. I am excited to share some of the thoughts on how this can be further enhanced in the future. One, we can optimize it by detecting the reaction so it detects faster. Two, we can also develop a mini bot so it interacts with the driver and keeps him awake. Let us see the achievements of this project. This project was, was presented in National Institute of Rural Development and Panchayati Raj. They were impressed and awarded cash prizes and a shield for competing among 250 projects. We hope the project is impressive and we hope you will be interested in knowing the price of the project. So the actual cost is Rs. 8,000 and for selling it costs Rs. 9,600 with a profit of 20%. So I think this is the cheapest uh, product in the market. So you can save more lives and a lot of money too. So I have uh, mentioned the price of each component here. Now let's see how the project looks like. The front view is plain with a webcam on top and the inner view has all the components. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Jairam sir who is a retired railway police officer and who helped in the improvisation of the project. And I would also like to thank our school bus drivers who helped in user testing and gave positive comments. Behind the most tired eyes, there are many Thank you and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Rastiv and Yohita, uh, for that wonderful presentation. I think before you presented your project, I would have never thought about this problem at all, let alone a solution. Uh, since we have about two minutes left, uh, I'd like to ask all the panelists to come on video, all the students, and I have a question that any of you can answer. 
I think at least it keeps me occupied for a long time. And of course, Ms. Deepa, Mr. Abhishek, Pranjali, you are welcome to answer too. So when each one of you was developing these projects, I'm sure you wouldn't have got it right in the first instance. Uh, can you tell us about some of the errors that you encountered and how you solved for those? Anyone can go first. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'll go first. So yeah. while creating a project, first of all, the idea was to create a cheaper a wheelchair and uh, like the uh, entire aspect of adding a hoverboard was it, it's we thought all of us thought that it was completely new and it's completely different. So uh, and uh, we we couldn't find it anywhere. Like we uh, so the first thing that was how to make sure that it's safe, but uh, also uh, like how how can we use it in real life and how do we put it? How do we make it work exactly and making sure that the chair is attached to the hoverboard in a way that it's it's safe for the person to sit. And uh, all that testing uh, was the hardest part, I would say. Arsha and ma'am, if you would like to add something else. Yeah, so rightly said, Tanya. So testing was honestly, where when we thought of um, taking a hoverboard as a, a maneuver kind of thing, and when we tested with the manual wheel, normal wheelchair that we had in our school, we use it for the students and for the support staff and everybody. Um, we thought, yeah, it works fine. But when we designed it and we started testing it because it was on hoverboard, the speed was literally uncontrollable. So many a times, um, the person who were testing it really bumped into the <laughs> walls and all. So this has happened. And when we were testing with our own staff members and with the teachers and all, they were so scared of sitting on it initially because they thought, oh, it, it's, it's, it's uncontrollable. So how to control that speed, uh, maneuver it properly, left and right and all, was the biggest challenge that we had in um, getting the hoverboard chair so yeah we keep on testing 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 and initially the people were afraid of sitting on it they were like okay if it it's not controlled it'll just bump into anything and it's it's a hoverboard so speed is like crazy if you have seen in the video it, it it's, it's just fly so this testing was painful in the literal sense yeah. <laughs> okay we can have a response from one more person before we end yeah, actually, uh, in this one also, like the one that the blind stick that we have done. So this was also a bit, uh, you know, initially when we were doing the testing at that time, because keeping all the three senses in proper synchronization, that was the most challenging part. Because what happens is that what logic you are using, whether you're using the and logic or the all logic. So that we kept on incorporating and checking. And at one time, like, so initially when we did, we found that only one sensor was working. Then we found that maybe uh, there was some problem. So there were several such problems that we have encountered, but ultimately we were able to synchronize all of them and it worked perfect. And, uh, you know, we were amongst uh, one of like the five schools that got selected out of the 120 schools in a contest and we were awarded for them. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, once again, I'm extremely grateful to all the schools, especially the mentors, Ms. Deepa, Mr. Abhishek, Vidya Ma'am, uh, as well as Ms. Pranjali, and of course, to all the students. Uh, Plaksha is looking for students exactly like you who are passionate, problem-driven, and can develop solutions on their own. Uh, thank you, and I would pass it back on to Pallavi. Thank you so much, to the four incredible teams from Pai Jam Foundation, Shiv Nadar School, Lalaji Omega International School, and Shishi Academy for those wonderful stories. To all the students who presented, I wish I were as smart as you are at your age. Thank you, Sanath, for being a great host and getting these wonderful stories together. Before we close the session, we'd love to get a quick poll and reaction from the audience, which you'll see shortly on your screen. So while we thought that all the, all the showcases were just fantastic, but which one of these 
touched you the most? Which one did you feel most inspired by? We'll give you about 30 seconds to answer this. There are no prizes for this. It's just to get a peek into your mind. It looks like the audience is really struggling to, to decide. Um, the votes are pretty much almost equally split between all four. So thank you so much, all of you, for these fantastic presentations. I think the results just reflect that, uh, you know, the audience itself is unable to choose which one they like the most because all of them were just great. So now we'll move on to the final session for this morning, which is our keynote session by Dr. Shiram Rajamani on technologies for development, can cloud and AI cross the digital divide? Dr. Rajamani will talk about the creative use of low cost technology to create large scale impact. First, introducing the host for this session, Mr. Mohit Tokral. Mohit is the founder of Vivtera, a global business transformation services partner. Previously, he was the executive officer and business leader at Genpact leading the banking, financial services, and insurance verticals globally. Mohit has served as an elected member of the NASCOM Executive Council and is on the Global Corporate Advisory Board of edX. He is also a founder and trustee of the upcoming Plaksha University. Welcome, Mohit, and over to you to introduce Dr. Rajamani. Thank you, uh, Palvi, uh, this morning. Uh, uh, I would say this afternoon, um, everybody, Thanks for joining us. And I have the privilege of talking to Dr. Shriram Rajamani this morning uh, or this afternoon. Uh, we are delighted to have him here and uh, ask him to give his thoughts. Uh, we would really uh, appreciate, we want to make this session interactive. Uh, Dr. Rajamani has, ha, you know, is, is the Distinguished scientist and managing director for Microsoft Research Labs, but you know he's been at Microsoft for so many years. And Microsoft, as some of you know, is world's one of the world's most admired companies, which is doing a lot of work in the space of technology and technology for good. Um, he has been a fellow. Uh, he's been awarded with multiple awards. He has worked as an academician and, uh, you know, has done a lot of work uh, in the space. Um, his research lab, they've been building solutions for India. Dr. Rajamani did his PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley and is also part of the uh, Plaksha advisory, academic advisory board. I would invite Dr. Rajamani to, uh, you know, share some of his thoughts uh, this afternoon, uh, it's an interesting conversation. He and I were chatting this morning and I asked him to really pivot and tell us a little bit of how technology is going to play its role for good, for education, for healthcare, and so all the things that Plaksha stands for today. And for this audience, which is listening uh, to all of us, uh, it will be interesting to get your thoughts, your comments and your questions, and we'll do that towards the end of, uh, of this session. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Rajamani to really share with us his, his thoughts for the next 20 minutes, and then we'll quiz him together on a bunch of things this afternoon. Yeah, over thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mohit. Uh, it's always such a pleasure to um, uh, participate in uh, Plaksha's uh, events. This is, I think, the third talk I'm actually I'm giving uh, to the Plaksha audience, and today I'm especially happy that you know parents and students, uh, young students, are also attending. Let me share my screen if that's actually possible first, um, uh, so that I can actually show my slides. Yeah, can can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yeah. So, so, so Mohit and I were talking earlier uh, this morning, and um, yeah. So today I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about uh, technology and technology for good. That's my con that's the topic of my conversation. But before I go to technology for good, right? One should recognize that 
cloud and AI is causing such a huge disruption, technological disruption in the world today. Um, uh, even if you think commercially, right? Now, if you don't uh, think about business, right? Be it accessing the world's information, uh, searching, be it improving productivity, you know, business intelligence, connecting customers and business together so that business actually understands what customers actually want, what tweaks we need to products in order to improve our sales. Now, be it automation, ranging from automation at the works you know, and manufacturing to automation in um, productivity industry, in business processes, right? You know, and, the, and the enormous democratization that the cloud, the public cloud is bringing to access to compute, computing resources. So that anybody, right? Anybody, you know, you know, like three students sitting in Bangalore can now do a startup that accesses expensive GPU resources to the extent that they want, right? And they can pay for it as they use. So this, these are the times that we live in where technology is causing such a huge disruption. But as Mohit was talking about, we are not gonna talk about business today. We are talking about how technology is used for good, right? And I'm actually especially proud to work for a company like Microsoft, which takes this very, very seriously. You know, taking how AI and cloud can actually help all of us. And these are the set of programs that, um, that we have. Let me see if I can actually minimize my, yeah, maybe that's better. That way you can actually see my whole slides. Yeah, uh, you know, we have programs ranging from AI for Earth, which is um, a, a program uh, commit, committed to using these kinds of technologies focused on agriculture, biodiversity, climate change, water, AI for accessibility, um, which is the use of uh, AI and cloud technologies to help people with disabilities in their daily life, employment, communication, connection, AI for humanitarian action, which is a commitment to help various organizations with disaster response, refuge, helping refugees and displaced people, human rights, needs for children, AI for cultural heritage, which is about empowering people to preserve and enrich cultural heritage, AI for health, which is not only about discovery of new health treatments, but ensuring that there is access to health for uh, disadvantaged and underprivileged people. Enormously inspiring programs. I mean, just to give you a sense, right? These things are not just words. I mean, the company is putting on the order of close to $200 million um, uh, on these programs. And that's the amount of money the company is spending on these things. Um, uh, I'll switch from that into, into this slide that in which I don't know how many of you have, have read this book. Um, it's a very interesting book by uh, Yan Chandrasekharan and Rupa Purushottam, Purushottaman. And Yan Chandrasekharan, as you know, is the, is the leader of um, uh, Tata Sons. And um, the interesting thing about the book is actually its subtitle, which is Solving Technology's People Problem. Where the, I have some quotes from this book here where the goal is to not to talk about technologies for technology's sake, but technology in context applied in ways that make sense to people. And this is especially true for India with such a demographic advantage with 1.3 billion people, where the conversation is actually, if we can combine people with technology, can we make sure that the combination benefits really all our citizens? Right, so this is the thrust of the book. And if you haven't read it, right, I really recommend it. It's a, it's a wonderful book. And what I'm gonna talk about today is I'm gonna talk about two specific stories from our lab in Microsoft Research India and Bangalore, where we have been really living these principles. Um, one in the context of safe driving and one in the context of um, tuberculosis medication adherence. And then we'll step back and do some questions uh, like Mohit was, was referring to. So let me go and start get started with the two stories, right? The first story I can I'm going to talk about is um, uh, on safe driving. Let me just do a quick check, right? I'm you every I, everybody can still hear me, right? Yes, and, we and can. see my screen. Okay, sounds yes, good. We can. Yes, we yeah. Can. So the, the first question we're going to talk about is actually can we use technology to improve safe driving? But before we talk about you know why we need that, let's just look at some stats. Road deaths are a major health epidemic. Right, it is uh, uh, traffic deaths are the top ten causes uh, causes of global deaths. In 2019 alone, right, our country India has had 1.5 lakh deaths due to road accidents. 
and these are key risk factors speed drinking and driving not wearing appropriate harnesses helmets distracted driving talking on the cell phone while driving these are some of the uh, key reasons why uh, there are so many um, uh, traffic deaths uh, in india in the west people think about self driving cars as the answer but you know even in the west it's going to be a while i mean here are some projections here it is going to be at least another 30 or 40 years before self driving cars become popular and in india it's going to take even long so drivers matter and they they are not going to disappear anytime soon so can we use ai not to replace drivers but to help drivers drive better so that is one of the goals we started a project called hams hams stands for harnessing automobiles for safety where the goal is actually to put a a smartphone Uh, in the in, uh, in in the in, in 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 before your windshield uh, so that the smartphone has two cameras one that sees the driver and that one that sees the field of view and together with the onboard sensors and the accelerator accelerator i mean other kinds of sensors obd sensors in the car can we now get a 360 degree picture of what's going on both inside the car and outside the car and use that to enable drivers to drive safely and there are many many applications you know we could use it for training drivers we could use it for driver license testing we are already doing that for monitoring fleets and so on and you know where we can use ai is using the camera that faces a driver to detect if the driver is fatigued you know if they are using a phone um you know uh, watching the field of view to to check whether a driver is approaching obstacles too quickly whether they are accelerating even in front of an obstacle tailgating whether they are actually parking properly whether they are actually observing speed limits there are many many things we can use you know computer vision and artificial intelligence to do and using these kinds of technologies we could do many many applications we could think about training drivers uh, we could think about testing like when you go to an rto uh, can we automate a driver's licensing test when you have fleets right be it ola or uber or shell or any ashok lyland any company that actually administers fleets you know can can we actually monitor uh, the fleets and then the whole point actually is to use ai to work with humans rather than replace them the so let me show you an example you know the example i'm going to show you is this technology is already deployed for license testing in dehradun today if you go to dehradun right and you go to the rto and take a driver license test the less test is done by this system so let me show you that the government of uttarakhand is uh, very proud uh, to start this initiative by using based to this driver uh, testing around the audio is not coming clear to this we are also very happy to have partnered with microsoft and idtr to take this initiative forward and i'm sure uh, we'll be able to deliver some world class services in a transparent manner to our citizens yeah so you saw that there so we started going live um, in the dehradun rto um, sometime last year and um, uh, uh till date i think more than 8000 license tests have been conducted in dehradun alone and you can now see various rtos across the country that are now interested in conversations with us we are also working with ola um which is as you know the largest you know cab aggregator in india and we are trying to use uh, this kind of technology for ola's own uh, driver testing for safety and even actually we are thinking about doing it as ongoing safety tests uh, as ola drivers drive the cars in the roads um one interesting um, fact that i found was that in dehradun the pass percentage is only 50% we actually fail 50% of the people but even the people that are failing are actually giving us good feedback saying you know you know this was very useful for me even though the test was not successful i knew what mistake i made I actually it'll improve um uh, my driving performance so i could come back tomorrow and i could become a better driver and i could also pass the test right so it brings sort of transparency inside the system um and you know we have been also receiving interest from netherlands you know all these different countries um and i think we are we are getting increasingly confident that that this kind of technology is not just useful for self driving cars but it's also useful for driver driven cars human driven cars to improve uh, safety so that's the first story i'll talk about the second story i'll talk about is using technology to eradicate to help eradicate tuberculosis here the story 
is um, uh, TB is another disease that you know kills you know more than a lakh people in India every year. Uh, the total number of tuberculosis deaths, if you look in 200 years, it's you know it's a, it's a huge number. It's 10 to the power nine, and it it dwarfs the number of deaths that 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 are happening had happened due to smallpox or malaria or AIDS, um, for example. And I mean TB is caused by a by a uh, by a bacterium. Um, you know, unlike you know COVID, you know we are all facing COVID. COVID is caused by a virus. Um, and b- bacterial uh, diseases are actually treatable by antibiotics. Um, and so TB has actually antibiotics. And uh, But the real difficulty with TB antibiotics is the duration of treatment. You have to take treatment for six months. And that's a difficult thing to do. And, and many people don't take medication for six months. You know, they maybe they don't know and they start feeling better and the medication has toxic side effects. So people just stop taking medication after a few months. And then that leads to drug resistant TB, which is both contagious and fatal. It's going to kill that person. And it's also going to kill the back because the bacterium is going to mutate. And anybody who contacts the disease from this person is also going to have drug resistant TB. So the World Health Organization prescribes a treatment regimen called DOTS. You know, that DOTS stand for directly observed therapy, where the, where the healthcare worker and the patient meet every day um, and the healthcare worker records the fact that the patient has taken uh, the antibiotic and they have to do this for six months. And this is the only surefire way we know to cure TB. But of course, this is so inconvenient, you know, both for the healthcare provider and the patient. It is such a loss of productivity for them to meet every day. Many of these are, you know, migrant people, people who live in remote areas, you know, for them to travel and meet is such a difficult thing to do. So 99 dots is a, is a technology that we developed in our lab, whose goal is to get 99% of the efficiency of dots with 1% of the effort, right? And then the, and the remaining, uh, 99% is actually going to come from amplification due to technology. And uh, this is how the system works. We work with you know, pill manufacturers, drug manufacturers, and, and we design a special pill pack such that you know, if the, when the patient um, dispenses the medication, um, uh, you see a, a hidden number into which the patient is count, counseled to give a free call. So, the, so as soon as the patient has the pill, they are, they are counseled to give a free call at this number. And... Um, so every envelope um, uh, has, a, has, a, has a unique sequence of these numbers and using some coding theory and the combination of the caller ID and the numbers, when the call comes, we know who is making the call. There are some algorithms that run on the cloud side that we can use to calculate you know, who is making this call. And using that and analytics, we can create a dashboard for each patient. So you know, this green means that the calls have come and the red means the call has not come. Uh, so when when a call doesn't come, then they, they, a lot of things trigger. Uh, you know, we send an SMS first to that person saying, "Please take your pills." If you still don't hear from them for a few more days, you know, we send an SMS to the healthcare worker saying, "Some of your patients have missed healthcare doses." And then we just go, we do counseling, and then we can see that people come back on treatment, and then they can continue their drug regimen. And this project has been going on for five years. It has now been field tested. It is now now part of the national strategic plan for tuberculosis elimination that was uh, proposed by Prime Minister Modi's uh, government uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it is also now part of the World Health Organization's handbook. Uh, you can see, you know, this is actually 99 dots is part of how the WHO uh, thinks about uh, medication adherence for TB. Um, uh, so, you know, we've had um, many, many uh, presentations in media about this. And here you can see uh, JP Nada, uh, the union health minister at that time, you know, launching. Uh, so, so today in India, it is actually mandatory in six states. Six states have a mandatory use of 99 dots. If you go to YouTube, you can actually even see Amitabh Bachchan uh, talking about 99 dots. I think that's perhaps the only project from our lab that, uh, that Amitabh Bachchan, I think, has talked about. Um, you know, here's Satya talking about it, and here you can see you know, Bill Gates endorsing it and so on. What is also interesting um, is you know, how these projects scale outside the lab. You know, this project, uh, at some point, it became too large to be run out of the lab. So we spun, a, spun out a separate startup company called Everwell, Everwell Health. It's now based in Bangalore. Uh, Andrew Cross, who was one of the people behind 99 Dots, is now CEO of Everwell. Uh, so, uh, so now um, more than uh, you know, 250,000 patients uh, are using 99 dots. 
but and you can sort of see the graph by by which the growth of nine dots it's now actually working in 15 countries um uh, i think it's now maybe even 17 and you can sort of see the the places where actually this is now spreading um it's now part of uh, you know who's uh, 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 standard of standard of care the other interesting thing that happened is that the everwell started building a digital platform for 99 dots but now the government of india has asked everwell to build to expand its digital platform to cover more and more tb um, uh, digital transformation so everwell is now expanding beyond 99 dots to various other aspects of tuberculosis uh, medication uh, and tuberculosis treatment uh, uh, spanning several other programs beyond 99 dots that are being being done by the indian government including for example direct benefit transfer now direct benefit transfer where, where tb patients are now given cash the cash actually now flows through uh, this software pipeline uh, for for you know, many many uh, you know millions of indians um so you know th those are the two projects that i want to talk about as a case study but i would say also that microsoft research uh, which is you know the lab that i work in in india um we work in you know four topics and this is not the only topic we work in we work in you know algorithms and data science machine learning and artificial intelligence we work in systems and this is the fourth area uh, which we call as technologies for emerging markets and over the past 15 years you know i mentioned 99 dots um uh, and 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 hams but we've been working on uh, illiteracy understanding uh, uh, literacy and semi literacy and how should you know software and hardware be designed so that illiterate and semi literate people can actually use and benefit from the software how can we use these kinds of technologies for transparency and you know, making sure that there is no corruption or can we help help agri agriculture uh, we've done a bunch of work on education um uh, mohit mentioned that we can talk more about that uh, incidentally i think vineet and i have been talking about collaborations between microsoft research and plaksha um in 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 the uh, space of technology for education we could talk about that we've done a bunch of work in employment and empowerment uh, connectivity i mean it's a very important thing in india you know most of us that live in cities take internet connectivity for granted you know but if you go to rural areas there is still an issue uh, how to do that uh so we could talk about many of those kinds of things but since we are a lab right in addition to doing these projects we also step back and think about insights and body of knowledge that we can create you know thinking about frugal innovation where we combine in, in in each of these examples you can see that how you combine low cost technology with social engineering and people thinking about technology as an amplifier but not as a substitute or a replacement for human ability right thinking about users thinking about how constraints like literacy affect users uh, how do you need to design interfaces for users taking these into account now what good it is if you have the highest bandwidth connectivity and the, and a coolest smartphone if you don't have the literacy to 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 benefit from that you know thinking about needs and aspirations of people um distinction between needs and wants the most important thing as a as a scientific endeavor you know if you come up with an intervention like 99 dots does it really work you know just like the 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 pharma companies do um uh, field trials like now like for covid there's field trials going on uh, in phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 on whether whether the whether the vaccine is actually effective you now we do similar such studies for 99 dots right we we think very objectively as to whether it's actually useful or not useful so so all of this is actually very important to to think about this as science and do real science uh, so i i will conclude you know going back to you know this slide where um, technology has tremendous promise to help in many many uh, walks of life um, uh, as people uh, you know than just um, uh, merely uh, optimization for business and increasing profits uh, so i i will just stop there and um, uh, go back and then uh, let mohit and you ask me questions and have a conversation so dr shriram thank you so much uh, for this conversation uh, and giving us uh your thoughts here uh i am going to open up to the group for q and a in a bit but you know i have uh, some questions for you okay right and uh you know i mean you talked about um you know how microsoft and you know as you read a lot microsoft really is really creating and building technology which is really cutting edge and then then they're really trying to solve for what actually we believe in our whole cultural ethos of plaksha is about you know how do you how do you really build up um 
how do you manage what we call as the fourth industrial revolution changes, right? And then solving some of India's grand challenges, right? I mean, we have parents, uh, young students here and, and teachers who are actually in their own way are trying to make an impact in, in as you build the new India, right? Uh, and clearly one of our objectives as Plaksha has always been that how do you solve for you know, issues like healthcare, uh, education, uh, and, and agriculture, right? And things like those. Uh, and today, you know, in the last six, nine months, the pandemic has really accelerated the digital curve completely, uh, what we would have not thought about it changing in the next 10 years. And, you know, at Plaksha, we believe that we, we will help drive and accelerate that digital curve and the technology curve even faster because we are at a unique point where we do not have a legacy and we are now starting with a clean slate of white paper and we can really redesign, reimagine what we want to do. And that was the uh, ethos and the thinking about Plaksha saying how we can reimagine education. I'm sure a lot of folk, kids, uh, academia and parents who might be listening today uh, have these questions of how education is going to change. Uh, I know Microsoft has done a lot of work and, you know, we don't want to talk about education only in the larger cities, right? We want to take education to down in smaller cities, tier one, sorry, tier three, tier four kind of cities. We'd love to get your perspective of how Microsoft Research Labs and Microsoft on its own thinks about enabling just not Plaksha, but people like Plaksha to evangelize and take education to different parts of the country. And there are a lot of people who might be on this call from different parts of India. And I think it'll be good for them to hear you and your thoughts from a, from a technology perspective and how technology is going to really change the game there as we look at the next 10 to 15 years. So uh, thank, thank you, Mohit, for that question. I think, you know, the... Um... What is most challenging about, you know, even if you just take education as a topic, right, is the diversity of problems that come up depending on the demographic that you um, talk about, right? So if you, you know, I'm sure actually, you know, I don't quite know the demographic of students and and parents in this call, but my guess is actually most of them are from cities, uh, from relatively affluent schools. Um, uh, you know, there actually the, the, the challenges are uh, of one type. But, you know, if you go to, you know, tier two, tier three, I mean, there is even um, a scarcity of teachers, right? Um, the scarcity of equipment, um, um, a scarcity of technology, scarcity of everything, right? So how do you do that? Let me just give you two or three examples. You know, a, about, seven, about 10 years ago or so, we had a project called Digital Study Hall. Uh, and you, you can look that up uh, on, on the internet. The whole point there was to see whether we can amplify the ability of a teacher. Like suppose you have a, a school in tier two or tier three where you don't really have a qualified teacher. You only have quote unquote a teaching assistant. That is all that you have. Yeah. Can you now use mediated instruction, right? Where you play recorded videos by somebody else from the city but this person administers and does this blended learning where Absolutely. this teacher is also learning along with the students. Now they stop, they have a discussion, they do that. We have done studies like that. Uh, it's incredibly interesting studies we have done. The other thing I can tell you, another one that I can tell you, Mohit, is that in, 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 in affluent schools, right, now there's a notion of clickers that come. Like, for example, one of the reasons why clickers are used, I mean, a lot of the universities in the US use it because when the teacher asks a question, right, it's usually the dominant kids that put up the hand and give the answer. And in most, mostly it's boys, right? Um, the, the people that are shy, women in particular, they just don't even participate actually in, 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 in uh, talking back actually to the teachers, right? So how does a teacher even understand what fraction of my class is understanding what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So for that, clickers are used. So basically the teacher now asks a question and everybody clicks an answer and the teacher gets a summary. So the teacher knows actually how many, how many students understand that, right? So imagine going to a rural school are, how are you going to put clickers there, right? So we did a project called Q cards where everybody is given a card, 
the card has four answers a b c d right depending on that you rotate the card and keep it like that and and then a camera just looks at it and the camera can identify how many of the students are answering correctly right so this is actually a low cost way to get feedback from students and so the third thing i will talk about is actually vinith and i have been talking you know together with another colleague of mine sumit gulwani to think about how we can use ai to improve programming education right when you do teach programming um you know how can we make sure that we give personalized assistance to kids who learn programming depending on how they understand right so these are you know this the spectrum is very very large as you can see thank you thank you i have a question from uh, from uh, uh, dr khan a question is technology penetration is from top to bottom strata of society how will we change this flow basically he is questioning how will we inverse inverse the pyramid right because right now the pyramid is uh, you know the way the pyramid is how do you make it stand on his head so that technology flows not from top to bottom but from a from bottom to top and you alluded to it the question about our villages and uh, you know expanding into different rural parts of india right and with now fiber and bandwidth and telecom becoming uh quite active how do you see that play out but still i mean look at it some places we still don't have networks and bandwidths the way it should be uh, how 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 do you see that you know you do do you see that how do you see that changing over the next few years and how, how what's how what's your thought process on that i mean first of all i think connectivity is improving enormously right and it's growing at a very very rapid pace uh, so that i think is is a good thing but i think regardless of connectivity right i think one of the things i think <coughs> we need to think about quite carefully is what is the benefit that you are actually giving to people why should somebody in chatisgarh yeah. why should they go seek out uh, being part of the digital economy right and you know of course actually you know one of the one of the biggest learnings from our lab is the distinction between needs and wants right a lot of us you know who are who are privileged think about oh when we think about technology we have to help people with health care or we have to you know help people with education I mean, those are thoughts right but when you talk to poor underprivileged people right they have aspirations like the rest of us they want to have entertainment they want to have jobs you know they want to you know buy things so i think those are like you know those kinds of things create pull uh, from people uh, so to give you a particular example right one of the projects that we are doing in our lab is called karya and karya is about dignified digital labor can we now take people in second and third tier cities and let them learn a livelihood using digital labor now mohit when we were talking this morning you were talking about um gig work um and gig economy and so on right can we actually create a gig economy where people that live in second and third tier cities can participate and actually earn a livelihood right the, the government of india has a program called um, uh, mn rega where you know you can uh, you can actually earn money by doing physical labor right can similar can we similarly enable digital labor and this digital yeah. labor is very important because only through digital labor we can actually do create data for low resource languages for example right ai now it works for english it works for german it works for chinese it is starting to work for hindi it's going to starting to work for tamil telugu mm -hmm. languages in which there is money right but if you actually take a language like gondi which is actually spoken in chatisgarh there is the incentive for somebody to create training data for that to onboard gondi into the digital highway right you know something like um, uh, gig work to do that so that the people who speak gondi can help bootstrap gondi on that and make money during the process right so we have to think like that so that we make difference to people lives uh, people's lives i think yeah thank you thank you uh, really helpful so one one uh, question for me and then i'm going to switch it back to uh, 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 a question which is coming up from our group here you know plaksha believes that the future is also about research right you you run microsoft research in india um and research is going to be very critical and important right i mean a uh, world over we've seen great institutes uh, and in institutions have got built because they've built great products great great uh, research great technology and you know uh, there's so much to be done and in india requires lot more research capability than it has today one of plaksha's mission is to build 
uh, deep research capability within uh, within our own environment in our campus coming up in Mohali. Uh, and this is also for the students and everybody who are listening that we are wanting to build and do some cutting edge research. Having said that, I would love to get your perspective. You know, Microsoft does a lot of work in research, right? Right now, you you all using AI, machine learning, IoT, are doing so much of work even on COVID-19 uh, around the world. You know, Microsoft has done so much work in healthcare, whether it is, uh, you know, for glucomia, for iris, whether it is for even people who are blind, um, you know, in uh, for heart, there's so much of work Microsoft does, both on the healthcare side, um, agri side, and, and, and various other areas, right? In an environment which is so dear to the younger generation of today that we want to live in a more clean environment. How do you see, and what would you suggest to us as Plaksha and to people who are listening about, you know, the importance of research and, and encouraging young talent to, to really, you know, building products and doing research and collaborating with academic institutions like us and corporates like yours who are investing so much in research. We'd love to get some of your thoughts on that as well, because that's so much of core and center of what we want to do at Plaksha. Yeah. So I think one of the things that I have actually found as a very interesting difference between my experience in the United States where I studied and lived for over 15 years. And mm -hmm. since then I've now been back in India for over 15 years is that the circulation of people between academia and industry in India is not as much as it actually happens in the U S. I mean, I went to grad school at Berkeley. I see the number of people that do startups out of, you know, Berkeley or Stanford go back and forth between Silicon Valley and the academia, it is just not just ideas, right? It's also people that move back yeah. and forth. Yeah. Um, so one uh, observation I have is that in India, we need that circulation of people. I think once we have circulation of people, right, the ideas will also flow, you know, between academia and industry. So we need many more people going back and forth. Uh, and it happens much more in the West uh, than in India. And, uh, and, um, and, uh, and I think, you know, Mohit, when I talk to you and I, when I talk to Vineet, uh, it's, it's, it's really admirable that you think about the connection between academia and industry as integral part of um, uh, a Plaksha. And I think the more in universities do that in India, I think the more uh, we stand to gain as a society. The second thing I will mention, uh, Mohit, is that um, for students, uh, young students in India who are thinking about uh, you know, what, what they might want to do in terms of research and science you know, as, they, as they build their careers, my own experience in Microsoft Research India has been that really there are, you know, you can think about two kinds of work that you can do. You know, if you are, uh, the internet is a great leveler because of the internet, right? You can actually access anything, right? Every conference you can actually now attend. Access is now not a problem. Yeah. I think it's important that a country like India, people just really understand the state of the art, right? And be at the leading edge of things without worrying about applications. I think it's very important to do that because you have to be at the state of the art, right? Science works by pushing the state of the art, right? So you have to do that. You have to also actually think about how that knowledge is actually applicable to our problems, like agriculture, um, uh, healthcare. You have to do both, right? The reason why you have to do both is that interesting breakthroughs happen in between fields. Right? Knowledge happens when serendipitously a really brilliant idea, which may be applicable only in the West, suddenly has an application. Maybe technology has changed. We can now run, run the same machine learning algorithm in a small form factor with low cost. And that's actually going to cause a disruption. Right? So one suggestion I would give is to not box yourself ahead of time saying, oh, I'm actually going to work only on India related things, or I'm actually going to work on only, I mean, as a young person, be open. Be open, be open to future possibilities, study everything, study what catch, catches your fancy, right? And go after knowledge uh, and, and have diversity of people working on Western problems, Indian problems, all of them, and have them talk to each other. That's been my experience in, in the lab in India. If you do that, right, surprise, surprising things come up. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I have one question more by, by Ayush Patnagar. Uh, I think he's trying to... Uh, understand from you 
What do you think about the conversions of black uh, of blockchain and AI? Will will both of their intersection be the fourth industrial revolution? So I I think that's a little bit. I think what he's trying to understand from you is that the conversion of blockchain and AI, and the intersection of that. What does this does it do something different, or uh, they are very different things, or you know, in parallelly working together to solve for. Different use cases and different issues around the world. I mean, they they are really two different uh, right. things, right? Uh, that's the bottom line. See, blockchain is actually used uh, as a distributed ledger to have an immutable record of what happens, right? You know, you suppose you have three or four businesses are interacting with each other, and suppose you need to have a record of actually what transactions have happened, you know, in between these businesses, in such a way that will hold water in a court of law. I mean, there's no uh, question that somebody has tampered this ledger. So that if there is a dispute, you know, the judge can look at, uh, you know, the sequence of things that have happened and then interpret the law, right? Uh, so that's actually what blockchain is used for. Uh, so in in some sense, like blockchain is what lets you get the intermediary out, right? Now, previously, you know, before you had the blockchain, right? In order to do these things, you needed to have an intermediary who trusts and that you trust and do these kinds of things. It sort of creates an agency to do that. Now we can do that with technology. In that sense, actually, blockchain democratizes these kinds of contracts between people. I think AI is doing a different kind of democratization, right? It is actually, you know, doing, uh, you know, uh, automating things that, in computer vision, in uh, you know, in uh, accessing information, um, uh, improving uh, productivity, and so on. So I sort of really think about them as two different things, uh, both uh, improving, both quite important. But I don't think the merger of them is going to do something that is bigger than the sum of its parts. I don't think so. I mean, these are two different things, and I think pushing both of them is going to help. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. You know, because some of us have been involved with AI and blockchain. Blockchain obviously solves for different problems. In fact, some of the underlying technology could be derived from what AI technologies are. So the way AI is built today. Um, you know, I, I don't have any questions coming from the group, but I do have. Uh, you know, I want to just say, and I maybe have a question as well here. You know, for 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 if you look at it, you know what Microsoft does, and I'm sure a lot of young uh, children and uh, folks on this call have an aspiration to be at Microsoft one day, right? Or or work with Microsoft, or innovate, or do things with Microsoft. Uh, you guys are really on the on the uh, very different cutting edge of what Microsoft does, and you know. Uh, since Satya took over, it's a very different company. Um, you know, one one advice to these youngsters as they look at, you know, move, taking the next step in their lives and becoming technologists or or you know studying technology or studying all the interesting uh, courses in the future. What one advice you would want to give them? Uh, uh, would would you want to give them? Uh, in terms of as they step into, you know, getting out of school and getting into college in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, what would be your one one advice as you've seen so much happening both in the US and India? Yeah. So I would say, you know, for a student that is starting out now, the number one advice I would give is actually plan for a career over, you know, 30, 40 years, right? Um, that means that you know, if you look at computing, right, by the time you graduate, I mean, to give you a sense, right, I, I did my uh, undergrad in Gindi Engineering College in Chennai. Uh, I, I graduated in 1991. The first computer that I used actually was a mainframe with a punched card. And that's the computer that I used. Actually, That's the first program that I wrote. And look at actually how computers are uh, look today. You should fully anticipate that you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the whole tech landscape is going to be dramatically different from the tech landscape you are facing today. So my uh, number one advice I would give to students is actually concentrate on the basics, concentrate on math, concentrate on basics of technology and understand concepts behind technology in addition to its manifestations. I mean, of course you can build the next, next Android app or iOS app. That's a good thing to do because it helps you be more practical, but step back and understand the principles behind these kinds of things so that your career can weather the changes that are gonna happen in technology 10, 20, 30 years down the line, right? I mean, that's actually number one advice that actually I would give to students. They think really long haul. 
Uh, and, and the other thing is actually, you know, really value expertise. In whatever you do, do it sincerely and be curious um, uh, and, and ask questions and, and, and be not satisfied with answers if the answers don't make sense to you. Go after them, right? Yeah. Because it is the, the curiosity is really the only thing you have. And that's the only th- asset that all of us have. And that's the mother of everything. Right, so those would be the two things I would say. Yeah. I, I I fully endorse what you're saying. Curiosity is the most important thing. You know, even where we are and at our age, I want to I want to learn every day. You have to be curious about things every day. You know, I have one very interesting question Nalini is asked. I think it's very pertinent to today's times, and will that will be our last question to you before we wrap this session? How could we bring this transformation in lateral workforce in the industry? I mean, the graduates who joined a year or two back in companies, right? So there are people who joined last year and there are kids who joined the corporate world this year, right? This year, they joined in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, Last year, they joined just before the pandemic, right? And uh, there is so much shift now happening uh, in, in the world and how work is done and how work is administered and, you know, things are happening. Oh, what, 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 uh, how, 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 any thoughts on that, right? Because that's a massive thought process shift that all of us, even who've been working for 30 years in our lives, have to re pivot. Yeah. Uh, what's your, what's your, you know, and you must have seen this in Microsoft a lot, right? And Microsoft even just announced that they are saying everybody can work from home, you know, till whenever they want to work. If they want to come to office, that's fine. How how are you? How do you think that headset and mindset will need to change uh, as you think about now and the future for all these youngsters who join companies or organizations? So, Mohit, right, the number one thing that I think it's becoming more and more clear to me with every passing day is that learning has to be lifelong, right? Gone are the days like you know our parents had a lifestyle where you go to college, you finish studying, and then you start working. And yeah. then you work typically in the same job, right? And you yeah. get better and better at it. You help your community, help you know, your children, your parents. See, this uh, kind of linear progression is just obsolete right now, right? Uh, you know, like learning has to be lifelong. If you join the industry, it doesn't mean that your learning is over because the technologies that you're working on today are going to be obsolete. You know, even five years down the line, you're going to have new technology, right? So I think universities like Plaksha, I think have a great opportunity to imagine lifelong learning where, you know, after your students graduate, right, you know, they should be in touch back with universities. They should contribute back and the universities actually should teach them more. Uh, And I think this flow of of people, you know, between academia and industry has to be really, really continuous. I think it's so important to do that. And I think both the industry and the academia stand to gain by, by doing that. Thank you so much. I know we are on time. I really appreciate you taking this 45 minutes to talk to us on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, we're not going to keep you away from your lunch uh, and everybody else on this uh, is this panel, but I really, really appreciate you coming and talking to the group. I really thank everyone who logged in. We had over 100 people who were listening to you uh, a while ago. Some of them maybe went for an early lunch. Uh, we're down to 90 but really appreciate you coming and talking to uh, the group here. And I'm going to hand it over back to Palvi uh, to close uh, the morning session today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mohit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajamani, for a very insightful session as always. We're really grateful to you for all the time that you've made over all of these months to guide us on the Plaksha vision. Uh, thank you so much, Mohit. Thank you for making the time to host this session. My pleasure. Um, pleasure. Thank you, Pallavi. Thank Bye-bye. you, everybody. Have a great afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. And with that, we come to the end of this track. Thank you, everybody, for being a wonderful audience. Uh, we really look forward to seeing you later this evening at 6 p.m. for track three of Infinity 2020. Track three is called Tech Leaders for Tomorrow. What you see on your screen is the schedule for the evening. We start with a talk by Dr. Shalini Kapoor, who is an IBM fellow Uh, and Director and CTO India of IBM AI Labs. We have another keynote session at the end by Arvind Gupta, who is the founder of IndieBio, partner at Mayfield Ventures, and who has funded some cutting edge biotech startups around the world. In the middle, we have a panel discussion 
by three leading tech entrepreneurs um, in the space of AI. And the second session that you see is actually a pitch by high school students on startups that they're working on. And these have been selected after an extensive pitch contest where we had immense participation from across the country. So it's a really exciting evening. We look forward to seeing you there. You will receive a calendar invite with the Zoom link shortly. Hope you have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you so much for being here with us.